Good afternoon. The first item of business today, or this afternoon I should say, is a debate on motion 10358 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the Islands Scotland Bill at Stage 1. Can I ask all members who want to speak in this bill, to in this debate, to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Hamza Youssef to speak to and move the motion in his name. Uh, Presiding Officer, I'm delighted to open this Stage 1 debate uh, on the Islands Scotland Bill. Uh, Presiding Officer, it would be fair to say that uh, being Transport Minister does not make me the most universally popular person on the planet. However, I do have to say my colleagues and often those across the Chamber do envy me when I have the islands part of my portfolio. Uh, Travelling across Scotland, seeing some of the most stunning parts of our scenery, some of the most beautiful places uh, to live on this naturally beautiful country is something that does fill uh, others with envy, but it is also, I should say, a great honour and a great privilege for me too. Our islands are wonderful places to live, wonderful places to work, wonderful places to study and wonderful places to visit. They contribute so much to Scotland and it's vital that as a parliament we acknowledge the very unique role they play in our identity, in our economy and indeed in our society. Since becoming Minister for Islands I've had the pleasure to visit over 30 islands and their communities uh, so far and I've been struck by their differences in terms of of course the geography but also the very very strong similarities uh, that they share as well a resilience a vibrancy a warmth uh, thanks to everyone who lives on our islands they are very welcoming uh, and very opening uh, indeed yet there are challenges almost every island I travel to there is a common thread uh, of issues and I think anybody who has traveled to our islands anybody who lives on our islands indeed anybody who represents our islands will recognize some of these common challenges. Remoteness, declining populations, transport, digital connectivity, housing, health, and many other issues as well. Often all of these actually uh, play, playing and contributing to uh, the declining population issue that I just mentioned. Uh, this government has been working in partnership with others to address many of these challenges through a whole range and a whole host of policies, uh, initiatives, and indeed uh, investments, such as, for example, over one billion pounds in our ferry services, including the budget proposal uh, recently uh, agreed of 10.5 million for Orkney and Shetland for internal ferry services, uh, 25 million pounds in a rural housing fund, 5 million of that in an islands housing fund to deliver affordable homes. A fuel poverty we know, uh, a huge issue, one that I know, uh, for example, Lee MacArthur in particular uh, has mentioned uh, on his island uh, community in Orkney. Uh, fuel poverty and efficiency programmes with over 16 million pounds invested in islands local in island council areas. Uh, over £270 million pounds invested in airport facilities across the Highlands and Islands, with over £60 million in the air discount scheme, uh, £6 million recently announced in the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund, and so on and so forth. And I can uh, speak more to some of these, perhaps, uh, in my closing as well. Of course, Lee MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking an intervention and for his reference to fuel poverty, which, uh, as you'll um, appreciate, is, is highest in the Orkney community uh, I represent. But it's also an example of where island proofing in terms of policy now um, would be beneficial. Uh, you'll be aware of the issues I've raised with himself and his ministerial colleagues. Uh, would you not think again that the, the, the recommendation from the committee uh, to retrospectively apply island proofing to some of the most yeah, egregious yeah. examples of where policy and legislation isn't working for islands is a sensible move? Yes. Minister. I will address that point. I thought it might well come up. I'll address it later on in my, my contribution. Uh, fair to say that the committee's recommendation wasn't for a blanket uh, retrospective uh, look at legislation. As he says, it was to look at specific examples. And I think perhaps there, there, there is a way that we can closely work uh, to identify what those examples are and see where we can come to a common solution. But I'll perhaps uh, come to that in a little bit more detail uh, in my contribution, if the member uh, will allow. I, I essentially, of course, uh, want to improve outcomes uh, by creating the right conditions for investment empowerment uh, and increasing sustainable uh, economic uh, growth. Now, the Islands Bill uh, certainly is a part of that, but let's be under no illusion. There's no magic solution. There's no uh, silver bullet. There's no single policy that will make this happen. But the measures in the bill alongside the actions taken by governments, by, by government, by local authorities, public bodies and communities themselves will undoubtedly contribute to creating the right conditions for growth. Now, I welcome the Rural Economy and Connectivity uh, Committee's report, uh, which recommends that the Parliament support the general principles of the bill. Uh, I want to thank members of the REC Committee and other parliamentary committees for their very thorough scrutiny of the bill. The committee was uh, no doubt helped by uh, the, in their efforts uh, to take evidence from a wide range of organisations that they consulted with. Meetings took place, I know, on Mull, 
Orkney uh, and the Western Isles and good use of video conferencing to speak to people in the University of Highlands and Islands uh, and indeed the people of Arran as well. It's heartening to see colleagues uh, making it easier for people to participate in the development uh, of a bill through the use of technology. Uh, thanks are due to everyone who took the time to give their and offer their views and experiences to the committee or indeed uh, to us in government. Uh, time and time again, I've been encouraged to hear organisations and individuals express confidence that the bill will make a real difference in helping public bodies look at islands in a different way. In particular, I'd like to thank the local authority leaders and chief executives who have been feeding in their comments and aspirations through the island strategic group. Uh, it was a willingness, in fact, to collaborate and cooperate that brought this bill forward. Credit must go to that fantastic campaign, Our Islands, uh, Our Future, and I want to uh, continue that collaboration uh, and that good work and that engagement uh, with the local authorities and the council leaders. And I have a good relationship uh, with the three Holy Island council leaders, but also uh, the other three uh, leaders of the councils uh, that uh, have islands uh, as part of the local authorities. It would be... Yes, if I just finish this very, very... Uh, of course, yes. Credit to the predecessors uh, and the previous leaders uh, of both or of uh, Orkney, Shetland, uh, and indeed the Western Isles. But of course, I give preempted. Uh, uh, so I better think of something else to ask. Um, uh, uh, the um, the uh, Islands Minister will be well aware of the arrangements to do with inter-island ferries and the, and the arrangements now in relation to looking forward and, and resolving the issues about capital expenditure and indeed revenue expenditure. Uh, he plans with his colleague, the Finance Minister, to uh, have a working group on that. Can I ask that the person he plans to chair that gives it the impetus that's clearly needed, both from the government's point of view and indeed for those who need, use the service on a day-to-day -day basis? Minister. Yeah, I think Lee McCarth, uh, sorry, uh, Tavish Scott makes a, a very, very good point here that, uh, my apologies, uh, I clearly, <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, I'll move on. Uh, thank you uh, for that intervention. What I would say to Tavish is uh, I am completely uh, understanding of the fact that the agreement, of course, that was secured in the budget uh, was very much uh, uh, in tandem with this uh, working group looking at the longer term arrangements and uh, you know we must uh, absolutely take that forward I will take his remarks on board uh, the conversation with the local authority leaders I have to say has been incredibly constructive uh, as it has been with the Liberal Democrat uh, MSPs uh, as well as well as members across this chamber so he's absolutely right to raise that point uh, and put it of course uh, on on the record uh, going back to the bill uh, presiding officer I very much welcome that at uh, this first stage of the bill we've already established a broad range of consensus in the bills uh, provisions, uh, though that does sometimes make me feel slightly uh, more nervous for the stages to come. But I'll always be happy to discuss issues where we have differences and attempt to come to a, a common solution uh, where that solution uh, can be found. Uh, part two of the bill uh, very much places a duty on Scottish ministers to prepare, uh, lay before the parliament uh, and publish a national islands plan. Uh, that plan will set out the main objectives and strategies in relation to improving outcomes for our island communities. This is a clear statement of purpose while also allowing for government uh, of the day to, to the flexibility to say what they will do to achieve uh, that purpose. The plan will, of course, work alongside existing plans and frameworks that will provide a strategic direction, uh, focus resources, and where necessary uh, targets, of course, for key areas of activity. As a key component of the bill, the National Islands Plan has attracted a good deal of comment and the committee have put forward a number of recommendations and I want to address some of these today if I can. Uh, the committee recommends that the bill should have high level objectives placed on the face of the bill. I do appreciate the intent uh, behind this, but we need to be mindful of the purpose of legislation. Uh, we make law to give legal effect to things we want to achieve or indeed things that we want to prevent. Uh, bills are not necessarily the place to make policy statements. An overall statement of purpose would need to be legally meaningful to a court, and I'm not convinced that this recommendation would necessarily achieve that. However, I do want to look at what alternatives are available. So can we look to see if something can be done, for example, within the National Islands Plan? We can consider bringing forward amendments which would set out these high-level objectives within the current frame of improving outcomes for island communities. Uh, this would seem to have the potential to meet the overall purpose of the committee's proposal, and of course I'd be happy to discuss that further with members. In the government's response to stage one report, I have already said, I have already said that I will accept the committee's recommendations to make local authorities a statutory consultee and consider other changes, including, for example, a time limit for the submission of the annual progress report and strengthening the language regarding consultation with communities. Part three of the bill on island proofing has been broadly welcomed and has attracted a lot of discussion and comment during the committee's procedures. 
Uh, the idea is straightforward. We want to ensure that an awareness of the needs and circumstances of our island communities are embedded in the decision-making process, uh, processes of public uh, bodies. The bill places a duty on public bodies to do this and will ensure that the interests of island communities are placed firmly and squarely at the centre of legislative policy and service considerations. That's something that many members across this chamber, and just most recently, uh, Lee McCarthy in his intervention said that government should already be doing. And I'd like to give members the absolute assurance that it's already happening. And a good example of that would be the social security legislation that has been taken forward, which my colleague Jean Freeman is already, uh, without this bill being passed, already looking uh, to island proof uh, where she can. Uh, to help uh, with this, we've included an island communities impact assessment process, where new or revised legislation, policies, or indeed services have a significantly different effect on islands or island communities than other communities, then an impact assessment must be undertaken. As with other impact assessments, the details of the process will be set out in statutory guidance. Island proofing has the potential to change the practice, the culture and the values of our public bodies. Uh, we all agree, I think every single one of us, and this was mentioned time and time again in the com committee's procedures, that we all don't want to see a simple tick box exercise and it must be in the words of the committee agile and fit for purpose the committee has made a number of recommendations on island proofing and we welcome and i agree with many of them not all but many of them and most of them and these are set out in our response but on retrospective uh, yeah of course I will. john mason he, he mentions island proofing would you accept that there is a slight difference between island proofing and island impact assessment and island proofing might suggest going further than actually the bill intends I think, I think island impact assessments, of course, are the process that you would have to go through. But island proofing, he's absolutely right. It's not just about uh, necessarily uh, the impact assessment itself, but it's changing the entire culture of how we think about doing legislation. But importantly, not just government, but the 60 plus uh, listed uh, public authorities uh, as well. So the member absolutely makes a, a good point in that regard. In terms of the retrospective uh, ask that some have made, and, and, and I think Lee MacArthur uh, made it uh, most recently in his intervention, uh, what I would say is that um, <coughs> I think a specific provision in the bill around retrospective uh, island proofing is unnecessary. It could, I think, lead to unrealistic demands uh, across a range of policies and legislation, which would be difficult to manage and I think be overly uh, bureaucratic. Uh, that is not legislation which is in the committee's words, agile and fit for purpose. But um, the committee has asked that the government consider putting in place an appeals mechanism uh, on the face of the bill as well. And I'm concerned that this approach actually risks creating the sort of tick box exercise and culture that I'm so keen to avoid. Now, other impact assessments that are set out in legislation, such as equality impact assessments, uh, do not have an appeals process, but they have also been incredibly successful. They've worked as they've been clear, flexible, flexible and responsive. I'm seeking to achieve the same for island community impact assessments. Uh, I will ensure that the issue is explored through consultation on the statutory guidance uh, and that a dispute resolution process is developed because we all want this bill to have its intended impact and that is uh, to focus on its aims of improving outcomes uh, to achieve uh, some of that. Uh, part four of the bill has uh, two elements to it, the securing of a special status for the Western Isles, the Scottish parliamentary constituency, uh, which has been universally welcomed. That proposal will allow the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland the flexibility to recommend the creation of one or, or two uh, member wards consisting of inhabited islands. Uh, that has attracted much more uh, comment. Uh, that, uh, the comments have been, in the large, very positive. Uh, I believe that we have the right approach in the bill uh, that will allow for greater flexibility. However, I do accept uh, the argument presented by the Boundary Commission and indeed the committee that a small change to the language in the bill may well increase flexibility further. So I've indicated that in line with the committee's recommendation. Uh, I will amend section 14 of the bill to change the wording from wholly or mainly to wholly or partly. Uh, part five of the bill relates to the new Scotland Island Area Marine Development Licences. I want all of our island local authorities to have the opportunity to build on the experiences of Shetland and Orkney and have more control in the development of their seas uh, around their islands. We've taken a purposely cautious approach to the bill in this area to ensure that it properly reflects the needs and circumstances uh, of our islands. The bill allows for local authorities with an inhabited island in its area to ask to be designated as a marine development licensing authority. And after consultation, regulations will be laid setting out the details of the scheme. Of course. Lewis McDonald. Mr. Can 
uh, indicate whether there's been consideration of the impact of making that requirement for an inhabited island, given, for example, that the Zetland County Council Act, as it currently stands, does not have such a requirement in order for Shetland Islands Council to regulate in that area? Yes, uh, yes, uh, it has been, and I'll come in my closing speech uh, to that uh, very point, and I'll try to reflect a little bit more on that. But it was raised, uh, most certainly, uh, uh, during the committee proceedings to me directly. And what I would say is, um, where the Zetland and Orkney County Council Acts have worked well, uh, we look to replicate that, but where there's clearly areas that we can diverge from it, where I think are sensible uh, to do so, uh, I will. Uh, the issue of uninhabited islands and the effects on un uninhabited islands in this bill have also been considered, I should say, with particular reference to St Kilda that people have mentioned, uh, and we're not unaware uh, of some of those. But in terms of marine licensing and the ma development of marine licenses uh, and the impacts that they may well have on uninhabited islands, uh, let me sum up on that in my closing uh, remarks, uh, if, I may, if I may. I'm do you know that I, I have to conclude uh, shortly. So, presiding officer, I'm very proud, of course, to be the minister uh, who is introducing the first ever legislation solely for the islands in this parliament. But of course, I'll be prouder uh, when hopefully we manage to pass this law, uh, pass this bill into law in a few months' time. So, I welcome the Rural uh, Economy and Connectivity Committee's deliberation. Today, I thought their thoughtful approach has been very, very helpful indeed. I'm looking forward to working with members across the chambers as we get to uh, stage two and then stage three of this bill. And this government will keep an open mind because. Uh, ultimately, we want the same as anybody else in this chamber, uh, the best outcomes possible uh, for our island communities for the future. Thank you very much. And I call on Edward Mountain to open it for the Rural Affairs Committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, I'd like to say we are delighted to present our report on the Island Scotland Bill. Sadly, as time is limited, I won't be able to cover all the points within it. I will try and pick out the most salient ones. And the committee does note the Minister's detailed response, which we received last Friday. As the Minister said, as part of our evidence gathering sessions, the committee undertook visits to Orkney, Mull and the West Niles. We took evidence for our video conference with the Islanders on Arran, as well as students from multiple locations, including the University of the Highlands and Islands. And we want to thank those islands who met with the committee, sometimes on very windy and blustery nights, to share their views. We'd, or I'd also would like to take time to thank the committee members for their diligence in, in tackling this task, and all those, also the clerks for their hard work in preparing the report. The committee were very aware of the hopes that islanders, um, that have, that, sorry, the committee were very aware of the hopes that the islanders have invested in this bill and which was embodied in their campaign, Our Islands, Our Future. We are, however, concerned there will be a gap between what islanders expect and what islanders will get from the bill. And we urge the Scottish Government to manage those expectations very carefully. To turn to our key findings, the committee called on the Scottish Government to review the definition of the terms islands inhabited island, island community, and high and low tide marks after the Scottish Law Society felt these terms required further clarification. The committee notes the Scottish Government has reviewed the definitions, but it has not committed to any undertakings in its response, and we look forward to a resolution from the Government on this during Stage 2 of the Islands Bill. On the National Islands Plan, the committee recommended that the island communities and other stakeholders should be comprehensively consulted so that the plan reflects the actual priorities of islanders. We note again that the minister in his responses agrees. The committee also felt that a national islands plan which has, overarch has an overarching strategy and takes into account the, the individual nature of each island is a prerequisite. We believe that this is best achieved through local decision-making structures, and therefore we recommend that Scottish Government amend the bill to make the creation of local authority-level island plans a statutory requirement. We welcome the Scottish Government's agreement to consult the six local authorities involved and to seek their views on this consultation. Now, the committee acknowledged the importance that uninhabited islands can have in terms of cultural, economic, environmental significance. And we recommend that uninhabited islands should not be left out of the National Islands Plan. We welcome the Scottish Government's reassurance that there is nothing to prevent uninhabited islands featuring, featuring in the plan and that this aspect will feature in future consultation. 
The purpose of the Islands Bill is to improve the outcomes of islands communities, and we feel it is important that performance can be tracked. Therefore, the committee recommends that the National Islands Plan is developed with clear outcomes, targets, and measurable indicators. We also suggested that a time limit for the annual report is included within the bill. We are therefore pleased that the government has acknowledged the need for monitoring and the assessment of progress. Turning to impact assessments, the committee called on the government to provide clear and consistent terminology. We felt that the use of the terms island impact assessment and island proofing were used interchangeably in the bill's supporting documents, and we believe that both duties have significantly different meaning, and it confused many of those who we consulted. The committee notes the Scottish Government's view that the terms were not used interchangeably, but we welcome its recognition that clarity and consistency of terminology is important, and that will ensure that the consultation and the guidance around the duty are clear. The Committee on Islanders are adamant that the island impact assessments should not be a tick box exercise, and I welcome that comment from the Minister today. They must be real and they must be meaningful assessments. The Committee agreed that for islanders to have confidence in impact assessments, they must have a mechanism by which they can appeal or object to assessments. Although the Government acknowledged our recommendation, I know that it's unprepared to include an appeal mechanism within the bill at this stage. With regards to retrospective uh, island impact assessments, the committee recognised that it is unrealistic to assess all current legislation. However, we do believe that retrospective action is appropriate if it can be demonstrated that specific legislation has a negative impact on the islands. We note that the Scottish Government is in agreement and we welcome that. We also know that the government does not believe it's necessary to specifically seek views on this, pa this part of its consultation on the guidance for legislation or policy that could be problematic to the islands. The committee will have to consider this, is this issue further at stage two. Now I turn to marine licensing powers. The committee acknowledged that local authorities support the principle of greater marine licensing powers and we look forward to seeing further details from the Scottish Government on this matter. The committee also recognised that the interaction between marine licensing powers in the Islands Bill and existing legislation caused confusion for some stakeholders. While the committee felt that a provision for marine licensing powers should be included in the bill, we are concerned about how this will work in practice. It may add an extra layer of bureaucracy that may overcomplicate the marine licensing scheme and there could be a potential for duplication. We call upon the government to provide further details on the relationship and interaction between the Islands Bill and the Marine Scotland Act 2010. <coughs> on constituency boundaries, the committee and indeed everyone we spoke to welcomes the Scottish Government has included a provision within the bill which will protect the Western Isles as a Scottish parliamentary constituency. The committee also welcomes that the Scottish Government will act on the suggestion of the Boundary Commission to provide greater flexibility to better balance council wards which consists of inhabited islands and we look forward to the Government's amendment at stage two. Presiding Officer, our report raises many issues and the committee looks forward to seeking positive actions on all our recommendations. Subject to the points being raised in our report, the committee recommends that the Parliament agrees the general principle of the bill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Peter Chapman to open for the Conservative Party. I thank you, Presiding Officer, and I am pleased to open for the Conservative Group today. I would like firstly to thank my fellow REC committee members, the clerks, and especially all the people who gave evidence to get this bill to this stage. It must be remembered that this bill has its origins in the initiative Our Islands, Our Future. And this was a piece of work started in 2013 by the councils of Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles to look at constitutional reform to give the islands more autonomy and more powers over the seabed and renewable resources. Presiding officer, this is an enabling bill and provides for future action by the Scottish Government. 
It is therefore important to manage expectations of islanders who may be expecting more immediate and tangible outcomes. The Conservative group support the bill at this stage. There has been an extensive consultation process to get the bill to this point. And as our convener has just said, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee held video conferences with the Aran Islands Council, the University of the Highlands and Islands, as well as Harriet Watt University. And we also visited the islands of Mull, the Western Isles and Orkney to speak to island councils and indeed the islanders themselves. And it was fantastic to get a feeling of the enthusiasm and the expectation island folk have for this bill. And it was a personal pleasure to get to see close up some of these beautiful parts of Scotland and the strength of the sense of community that they possess. Now, there are 93 inhabited islands in Scotland with a population of just over 103,000, 2% of the population. And only five of these islands are connected to mainland Scotland by bridge or causeway. So they are obviously dependent on ferries or planes to reach the mainland. And it is clear that constituents of these islands can face considerable obstacles when it comes to accessing <coughs> higher education and in some cases even secondary education. Access to healthcare and hospitals can be difficult and those like requiring long-term and ongoing care often have to be away from their family, families for long periods of time. On some islands, there are no care homes for the elder, elderly, creating severe problems for families. Now, access to these facilities are taken for granted on the mainland, but it is clear that if this bill is to mean anything, it must start to redress some of these missing services, provide real assurance to the islanders and improve outcomes for them. The bill needs to include one or two high level objectives, we believe, to give greater purpose and focus. What we want to avoid is confusion over what the bill is in place to achieve. Its purpose should be included and outlined from the, the beginning. Now this bill will be judged on the practical difference it can make on the ground for the islanders. Targets and indicators would enable the public to see the progress at every review. And I therefore welcome the government's response, accepting that this should be included in the bill. The committee recommends that the six island authorities be made statutory consultees during the National Islands Plan development. Now, government does not want to include a prescriptive, li a prescriptive list in the bill, and I understand that, but the island author authorities must be inc included. The National Islands Plan should be an overarching and strategic framework in which each individual island community can take full advantage of the opportunities the bill offers. Now, presiding officer, presiding officer, I welcome this bill and its concept of island impact assessment. Now, this mandates the government and its agencies to take into account the impacts of any new services or policies would have on the islands and address them appropriately. And the term island proofing, which has been used interchangeably with island impact assessment, is a term which the government needs to use with caution because the enthusiasm shown by the islanders during consultations must not turn to disappointment. Expectations need to be managed. The use of the term island proofing provides much greater expectation than island impact assessment does, and it may raise expectations which cannot be delivered. It is quite clear that retrospective island impact assessments may be unrealistic, but I agree that there should be an opportunity for any current legislation that severely impacts island communities should be retrospectively reviewed. <coughs> And although this would lead to more questions for the government, it would help strengthen what the bill sets out to do. Now, there was a lot of support from the local authorities for the idea of increased powers for marine licensing. And this would potentially be a big boost for these coastal communities. But there was some confusion regarding marine licensing that needs to be reviewed by the minister. For instance, the applications to, work, to vary work licenses, which were granted under Zetland legislation, would be exempt if they were made after the area had been designated. There is also confusion around the responsibilities and boundaries in relation to the 12 nautical mile limit, because in some cases, islands would share some of this area, and this needs to be clarified as well. But the last and the biggest concern I want to raise in today's debate is finance, or in the case of this bill, the lack of, or the lack of it. The costs outlined in the financial memorandum are only related to the delivery of the duties in the bill, 
There is no budget to implement new services on the islands. There is no budget to implement the National Islands Plan. And there is no budget to mitigate any areas for improvement indicated by island impact assessment. I'm delighted. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member very much for giving way. Would you also accept that while so, some things would cost money, it was certainly evidence from Orkney that if they were given more powers, they could use the existing money uh, to produce uh, a better result? Peter Chapman. Yeah, I, I, I do accept that, but I also, I also reiterate that there is a need for extra funds to address the issues, uh, that, uh, the many issues that we know are there. So if this bill hopes to help improve island life, it must contain a budget to add new services, new facilities, and new opportunities. There are expectations for significant improvements in these areas, but with no budget, they cannot be met. So, presiding officer, in closing, it is clear that this bill is a, a needs further work and that we can expect changes and improvements at stage two. I look forward to seeing them implemented because we all want this bill to be a success for the people of the islands. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. I now call on Colin Smith to open for the Labour Party. Thank you, President Officer. Labour supports that the principles and the spirit of the Islands Bill, that the contribution our islands make to Scotland's cultural and economic well-being is enormous. But as our islands are future made clear, there's a real need to better support and empower our islands. It is to the credit of those who established that campaign that today Parliament is debating the bill before us. It's a campaign that I hope has fired at the first shots and beginning to address the decade of centralisation of power we've seen in Scotland. An opportunity to empower our island communities and put local experiences and expertise at the heart of decision making. It would be, however, however, be fair to say that the Islands Bill is more evolution than revolution. Even if amended, I suspect it will not be as ambitious as the island communities themselves that it seeks to deliver for, uh, and managing expectations will be challenging. It's important, but modest provisions, although welcome, won't give our islands the power to fully transform their communities in the way it's clear that they want. But there are amendments that can be made to strengthen the bill, and I look forward to working with parties across the chamber as this bill makes its way through the parliamentary process. For example, that the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee rightly argue for the bill to be amended to include a purpose clause setting out clear overarching objectives. Of course, this shouldn't be overly prescriptive or limiting, and I recognise the Minister's concerns that it must have a clear legal purpose. But an explicit indication of the Bill's aspirations and how it will help deliver equity and sustainability for our islands would help to ensure that the reality of the Bill better matches its ambition and, for example, ensure provisions such as the proposed National Islands Plan do not fall short in practice. Paving the way for the development of that National Islands Plan is, of course, a key element of the bill outlined in part two. And that plan must set out not only a clear direction, but practical measures to be delivered. Local communities and stakeholders must be at the heart of the development of that plan. And I'm pleased the government have agreed to, to the call from the REC committee to make local authorities statutory consultees in the development of the plan and guidance. A one-size-fits-all approach, of course, would not work for such a plan. It must be about enabling local communities. As the Federation of Small Business argued in their evidence to the REC Committee, we need local solutions to meet local needs and local aspirations. Yeah, no problem. Jamie Green. Uh, I thank Colin Smith for taking intervention on that point. Uh, just looking at the bill in itself, with regards to what he's saying about how we can empower local communities and decentralise decision making, in which section of the bill does it actually do that? Other than the creation of marine licensing powers, I, I see very little by way of wording that actually uh, it gives legislative power or statutory powers to local communities. Consul. Thanks very much for the intervention. I think that's really a question for the Minister, but I, I do think there are elements, and I'm certainly not going to defend uh, the, the, the scope of the bill because I do think it, it, it doesn't go as far as it could do when it comes to empowering um, local communities. But for example, uh, the call to, to make local authority level island plans a statutory requirement, I think, would help in this regard. And I do welcome the government's decision to, to seek the views of local authorities when it comes to this particular matter. It's important that, that, that the bill and the work we do recognises the differences between the islands covered by the bill and, and works towards uh, ensuring that the unique needs of each island and island grouping are fully recognised. As a member of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, I'm pleased that it will be undertaking regular scrutiny of the National Plan and its annual reports. In particular, I welcome the commitment made in the Committee's report to provide stakeholders with the opportunity to present their views. Likewise, I welcome the Government's indication that the plan will include clear outcomes, targets and measurable indicators by which to assess 
performance. Giving Parliament a chance to monitor and scrutinise the plan's impact is vital. I would like to echo the Committee's call for a set time limit on the submission of the plan's annual report to be included in the Bill. Part 3 of the Bill covers duties in relation to, to island communities, including the introduction of islands' impact assessments. The Government's guidance on this will be key to ensuring the assessments function as they should, and I'm glad a commitment has been made to bring forward an amendment making the effective local authorities statutory consultees in the development of this guidance. In order for the impact assessments to be reliable, they must also be based on a strong evidence base. The Government has given a welcome commitment to review the data available on island communities as part of the implementation of the Bill and to work to address any gaps that arise. This data will provide a crucial foundation for accurate and dependable assessments. I am, however, disappointed that in the response to the REC Committee, the Government have failed to take on board the Committee's recommendation to introduce an appeal or objection mechanism for impact assessments. I appreciate there are concerns about the bureaucracy this may entail, but it would provide accountability and ensure that islanders have confidence in the process. There is a balance to be struck, but I do not believe this is an unreasonable ask. There is also a need to be cautious about the language you used, a point stressed by the REC Committee and raised by a number of members already today. The phrase island proofing and impact assessed appear to have become interchangeable, but it is clear they have different meanings. Impact assessing something does not immediately guarantee that action has been taken to resolve any issues this assessment raises, and by describing the process as island proofing, there is a real danger that expectations are raised beyond what the Bill will actually deliver. There is, as Liam MacArthur raised earlier, also a case we made for retrospective impact assessments for carefully selected acts. Part 4 of the Bill includes the welcome protection of the, the Western Isles Scottish Parliament constituency boundary to deliver parity with Orkney and Shetland, and that is very much welcome, as is the provision of flexibility for the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland to recommend smaller wards where this will lead to island communities being better represented. The need for such provisions do, however, highlight the current wholly inadequate rules, both in legislation but also, I have to say, in occasions simply made up by the parliamentary and local government <laughs> boundary commissions when it comes to recognising local ties, particularly in rural areas. The requirement for commissions to have regard to local ties is often meaningless, with parity completely outweighing arguments about the bonds of local communities. The wider issue of addressing the complete carve-up of communities by boundary commissions may be a debate for another day, but it is certainly one that we should have. Well, my colleagues will touch on other areas in the Bill, so, such as the, the inclusion of uninhabited islands. So, The last part I wish to highlight is the proposals in Part 5 to establish new marine licensing powers. These are welcome, but it must be, they must be developed and implemented carefully and in line with existing legislation, and there remains a need for clarity on how exactly these powers would operate. Presiding officer, in conclusion, Labour welcomes the general principles of the Islands Bill, but there does remain work to be done. Not only will there be a need to amend existing provisions in the Bill as it stands, the Bill currently fails to explicitly reference natural heritage. Scotland's natural heritage is of huge cultural, environmental and economic value, particularly on our islands. This should be reflected in the Bill with a clear commitment to safeguarding natural heritage on our islands. We also need to address the understandable concerns of local authorities about the financial burdens associated with this Bill. With Council budgets already stretched beyond breaking point, the Scottish Government must ensure that the implementation of this Bill does not put our island authorities at a financial disadvantage. Finally, the REC Committee highlighted, and I quote, many of the issues which affect islands could also impact on remote and rural mainland areas. Whilst to appreciate is beyond the scope of this Bill, there is an opportunity to reflect on the approach taken with this legislation in the future and ensure we better support and seek to empower all our rural and remote communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move into the open part of the debate. I call on Kenny Gibson to be Kenneth Gibson to be followed by John Scott. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, since long before the launch of the Our Islands, Our Future campaign, Island communities have demonstrated time and again that they are more than capable of setting their own agenda for development and of presenting their own ideas about how to deliver the best possible future for their own islands. In my own constituency of Curium North and the communities of Arran, Cumbria and Holy Isle, I witnessed firsthand how passionate islanders are about protecting and promoting their islands. From ferry committees to economic groups, from coastal protection task forces to community councils, and from early forums to rescue teams, communities are independent, resilient and in many ways self-sufficient. I believe the Islands Bill will not only help mitigate some of the challenges faced by island communities, but also empower them to make the most of their own natural, economic and cultural resources. Some challenges thrown up by island living are highly visible and relatable to those of us who live in rural areas. Transport, physical remoteness and infrastructure can all present significant differences from mainland services. 
However, other more hidden challenges can make modern life more difficult, including population decline and the lack of high quality digital connectivity. From the 192 responses received to the consultation published in 2016, over 85% supported the Scottish Government's aim of introducing a national islands plan. Respondents appreciated this plan to be laid before Parliament within 12 months from the date on which the Act comes into force, would tackle pressing issues, maintaining focus instead of offering quick fixes, and addressing need as it changes and develops with time. The Islands Plan will also increase accountability. By identifying objectives, setting measures and defining responsibilities, we can ensure that this bill actually delivers the real and lasting change our island communities are calling for. Some respondents called for tighter definitions and better mechanisms for reporting and review, and I believe this should be considered as the bill progresses. A phrase we will hear, hear increasingly often through this process, and we've also uh, heard a number of occasions already today, is island-proofing, the duty placed on ministers and public bodies to consider the unique nature of life on our islands in exercising their functions. This brings awareness of our islands to the forefront of political decision-making and ensures that proper assessment of new or revised policy, strategy or service is carried out when likely to impact directly or indirectly on Scotland's inhabited islands. This was supported by 91% of consultation respondents who appreciated the need for a tailored approach to legislation rather than shoehorning our islands into one-size-fits-all policies. For all, our, for all our islands are, of course, diff different. The Clyde Islands are hugely different in size, population, governmental structure and character from the three island authority areas and the Inner Hebrides, and their communities also want this bill to work for them. From working as alongside my islands constituents, I know how proud they are of the coastal beauty and marine life that makes their landscape so unique. Islanders already take pride in the South Arm Marine Protected Area and Lamlash Bay's no-take zone. I'm confident they will welcome the opportunity to have more control in the development of the seas around our islands via the implementation of a marine licensing scheme. The adoption of a holistic approach to the process of marine planning has been commended by the Law Society of Scotland. It is of vital importance that any new licensing regime fits into the national framework in place since 2010. The Marine Act created a more open and transparent licensing process and changes resulting from the bill should help not hinder this coherent approach to managing Scottish waters. Private businesses form an important part of island life and the National Islands Plan should bolster support for sustainable island businesses. The Federation of Small Businesses reported that 86% of business owners on Arnon Cumbria felt their island was a good place to do business. However, 28% of respondents admitted they had considered relocating to the mainland. Creating a positive business environment on our islands requires a multifaceted approach with issues of transport and digital connectivity of particular importance. Of course, the SNP government is investing £600 million to reach 100% of homes and businesses with super-fast broadband by 2021. And were it not for Scottish government investment to date, only 65% of premises in North Ayrshire would be connected to fibre broadband. Today, I'm pleased that 94% of North Ayrshire residents have access to superfast broadband, and with a new fibre cabinet currently being installed in Condonan, even more Arran residents will achieve superfast speeds in 2018, with 100% of even the most remote island residents across Scotland having access by 2021. In addition to connecting homes and businesses, more must be done to attract young, skilled workers to our islands to guarantee their future and ensure they are dynamic and attractive places in which to live and work. The challenge of Scotland's ageing population is felt even more acutely on our islands and the national plan must address this. Of course, the Scottish Government has already been working uh, for our islands and in my own constituency there have been a number of tremendous improvements in the last decade. Uh, housing for developments in Ben Lister and Arran, St Bayers and Cumbria. Ferries, we've seen road equivalent tariff in, uh, which has more than halved uh, the cost of cars going to uh, Arran, for example. Uh, £61.1 million invested in two new ferries for Arran, uh, £12 million a ferry for Cumbria, a new £31 million harbour for Brodick, uh, a, a one for Adrossan, uh, uh, going to be built over the next year or so. Uh, and we've also seen a £5 million uh, development to Largs Pier, which serves uh, Cumbria. Uh, and, uh, we can also look at the fact that uh, when the Marine, University Marine uh, Biological Station in Cumbria was threatened with closure and loss of 28 jobs, this government set, stepped in to actually help save it. Presiding officer, this island's bill should not be seen in isolation, but rather as part of the larger framework of legislative and policy activity underway to protect our island communities. Work in the Crown Estate and the Community Empowerment Act is also making significant strides towards returning more responsibility to the island communities. 
More, this historic bill demonstrates just how much our realms mean to the fabric of Scottish culture and society, and it is a, a bold step forward in meeting the unique uh, needs of Scotland's islands now and for years to come. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Gibson. I call John Scott, to be followed by Gail Ross. Mr Scott, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm delighted to speak today in the Stage 1 debate on the Islands Bill, a bill which will see real devolution to island communities at a time when we increasingly see greater centralisation to the central belt. Although not an Islands MSP myself, I admire and acknowledge the strength and the tenacity of island communities. The difficulties and challenges that arise due to weather and inaccessibility require the residents of all islands to be resilient and determined to make things work. Naturally, we all want to see more power in the hands of our islands, and they are eager for positive change so that they can set the agenda themselves to better themselves and their communities. Back in 2014, when our islands, our future vision was set out, we saw the islands really grasp the bull by the horns and put themselves out there with a plan which, regardless of the outcome of the referendum, saw more powers devolved to the islands. And whilst it was the Scottish Government that brought this bill to Parliament, it is the island communities which must be commended for their initiative to get the ball rolling, and we must not forget that. However, we must not forget that those who live in remote and rural mainland communities might be slightly worried about this bill. Many communities in these areas can be several hours from the nearest largest town. And this was highlighted in the Stage 1 Committee report, and rightfully the committee welcomes the Scottish Government's willingness to reflect on whether a similar approach to island proofing may be considered for remote rural areas. Places such as Arnamochan and the Mull of Kintyre are classic examples of peninsular and mainland areas that are far from larger towns and therefore lack choice of public services and amenities. Take the example of the Mull of Kintyre. It is, as the crow flies, 37 miles from my constituency of Ayr, but the drive in a car would take nearly six hours through Glasgow traffic to reach Campbellton. These peninsular areas, while connected to the mainland, often face accessibility issues when a vital transport link is obstructed and getting to the Mull of Kintyre, if the pass at the rest and be thankful is blocked, requires a lengthy detour via Damali and Crean Larach. And as we know, time is money, and this remoteness can have a significant knock-on effect on small businesses and delivery times. In short, this produces the same effect as if a ferry were delayed to an island. What we don't want to see is the elevation of islands in status at the expense of these remote rural areas, and we welcome the acknowledgement of this in the Stage 1 report. Turning now to constituency boundaries, and I welcome the intention that the Nahilim and Yar constituency will be given the same protection as the Orkney and Shetland constituencies. It is important that the Outer Hebrides archipelago is recognised as being the separate entity and community of interest that it is. In future, we will know that having these boundaries protected for geographical, historical and practical reasons will mean that when constituents send their MSP to this place, they can be sure that they are fully accountable to their islands and not to a part of the mainland as well. Of course. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way on his points about rural Scotland. Would he also agree that maybe we need to review the three constituencies that cover the whole west coast of the mainland of Scotland? John Scott. I can only imagine that, that that would flow from what I have just said, that there would be a need to do that, self-evidently. Turning now to the National Islands Plan, and some of my Conservative colleagues have already voiced their concerns about this, but I must stress that it's imperative that with a National Islands Plan, we see proper action and progress, not near, merely warm words and weak promises. I am glad the committee recognises this and has called for clarity. We must ensure that there are achievable targets and objectives in order that the islands experience the positive change they seek and that this is fully funded by government. As the committee notes, it's important that local knowledge is harnessed and there are local decision-making structures in place. I'm therefore pleased that the committee recommends that the Scottish Government amend the bill to make the creation of local authority-level island plans a statutory requirement. 
I know from speaking to my Conservative colleagues that there has been a real sense of enthusiasm and passion from the islands to make a success of this, and we mustn't let them down. Turning now to definitions, I want to reiterate the point made by the Scottish Law Society that there needs to be further consideration given to ensure that the Bill provides the clarity and certainty required to ensure that the legislation can be properly implemented. Both the committee and stakeholders acknowledge that definitions need to be properly defined, particularly island and island community. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, we want to see the enthusiasm for positive change in the island communities to translate into actions by the Scottish Government. For too long, the agenda of the devolved Scottish Government has been and still is one of centralisation. But finally, this bill goes some way in part to devolving power from Edinburgh into the hands of those who make the best decision for the islands, the islanders themselves. My Conservative colleagues and I will support the bill at stage one and we will seek to amend it at stage two to ensure it is robust and effective. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Scott. I call Gail Ross to be followed by David Stewart. Ms Ross, please. Thank you, President Officer. As Deputy Convener of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, I would also like to begin by thanking everyone that gave evidence, both in person and in writing, all the people that we visited on the islands, all the councils involved, and the people that have taken the time to provide us briefings for this debate. Your input has been extremely valuable. I would also like to thank the Clarks and Spice for all their hard work and my fellow committee members for a unanimously agreed stage one report. It's a comprehensive, in-depth piece of work, and I don't think that any of our committee imagined that we would put forward a report with nearly 300 points when we started our scrutiny all those months ago. This bill has come about largely due to the work put into the Our Islands, Our Future campaign run by Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles and the subsequent report Empowering Scotland's Islands Communities in 2014. We also now include not just island local authorities, but also local authorities with islands, namely Highland, Argyll Butte and North Ayrshire. When our committee was tasked with bringing forward the Stage 1 report on the bill, the obvious place to start was with islanders themselves. And many people were unsure how much scope the bill would have, what its objectives were to be, and how this was actually going to be turned into something with tangible benefits. We were, and we still have to be very careful, to try and manage expectations around what this bill is trying to achieve. It focuses on provisions designed to protect and strengthen Scotland's island communities. It aims to meet the unique needs of Scotland's islands by making sure that impact assessments are carried out on policy and decisions by public bodies to ensure that they don't have a detrimental or negative effect on our island communities. It puts in place a provision for the development of an islands plan. We expect this to set out both a clear strategic approach and the practical approaches to delivery. We want to be assured that the priority areas featured in the plan reflect the actual priorities of islanders. We recommend that the consultation on the plan be undertaken as widely as possible and that it contains a list of who actually was consulted. And there should be a method that allows a body or a group that feels like it should have been consulted but wasn't to address any concerns to the Scottish Government. We would like to see young people being a focus of the plan in order to try and keep them on the islands. And we want islanders themselves to have the opportunity to present their views when Parliament presents its annual report and the five-year refresh. Presiding officer, even though this is an islands bill, many of the issues that arose as being challenges on the islands can also be applied to remote and rural communities. And as a representative of a large rural constituency, it's only right that I address these. When Highland Council's Director of Development and Infrastructure, Stuart Black, came in to give evidence, he told the, com the committee, many communities, particularly remote and rural ones, are facing challenges that cannot necessarily be addressed through a piece of legislation. However, if the spirit of the, the bill involves examining remote areas and considering that they need additional protection, then that is positive for the wider Highland area. When the Minister for Transport in the Islands, Hamza Yousaf, came to give evidence to the committee, I asked him about remote and rural areas and he replied, rural communities should consider island proofing as a great opportunity. If the Islands Scotland Bill is passed and island proofing is successful in its implementation, there is no reason why the government should not look at that success 
and consider whether we want to explore that approach for rural Scotland as well. But our islands do face different challenges. We never disputed that, and hearing islanders' first-hand testimony has made us acutely aware that this bill is necessary. Being completely surrounded by water is one of those challenges, and although the submission by the Law Society of Scotland has thrown up some questions around the definition, they ask that we look at this in closer detail. In light of this, we've called on the Scottish Government to look at the terms island, inhabited island, and island community, as well as high and low tide. This is in relation to pieces of land that may be accessible at low tide by a natural causeway, but surrounded by water at high tide, not islands accessible by bridges, which are indeed islands, as my colleague Kate Forbes will attest to. The RSPB has supported our call to recognise the cultural, environmental and economic significance of uninhabited islands and asks us to go further and include them specifically in the bill. We have sought reassurance that they will be included in the national plan, but I am interested in the Minister's response to including them in the bill. As a member of another committee in Parliament, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I'm pleased to say that we've included recommendations that relate to both of these in the report. We fully expect equalities and human rights to be considered as part of the implementation of the bill. And we asked the Scottish Government whether the Scottish Human Rights Commission was considered as a consultee for the National Islands Plan. Presiding Officer, there's much more contained within the report that I can't cover here today. And I urge everyone with an interest to read it. I once again thank everyone that has contributed. One of the most important things we heard, the islands are not looking for special treatment, they're merely seeking equity. They're looking for the decisions that are made by public bodies not to disadvantage them. And a lot of islanders stress to us their hope that this bill will also have knock-on effects for the mainland. As you can imagine, presiding officer, I hope so as well. I commend the report to the chamber. Thank you very much. I call David Stewart to be followed by John Finney. Mr Stewart, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and this is obviously an important and historic debate for Ireland and indeed all of Scotland. And as a Highlands and Islands Regional Member, I'm delighted to contribute. And could I put on record my recognition for the work of Orkney, Shetland and Western Isles Council for their first-class policy analysis and campaigning work on this issue, work that was rightly recognised with the National Joint Campaign Award. And the Minister has been a doughty and persistent campaigner for an Islands Bill, and I hope praise from me does not ruin his political career. Uh, why a bill just for the islands? Well, surely mainland rural areas have the same problems. What about deprivation and employment and poverty in our inner cities? Well, of course, presiding officer, this is not a zero-sum game. And as iconic Secretary of State for Scotland, Willie Ross said in the second reading of the Highland Development Scotland Bill, and I quote, has never been more important than today that all of the country's resources should be fully exploited and the Highlands and Islands have much to contribute. This is not a case of giving to the Highlands and Islands, this is a case of giving the Islands and the Highlands a chance to play their full part in the future of Britain. Of course, beside enough, so much has changed in our island communities since Willie Ross's stirring speech echoed across Westminster. The discovery of oil and gas, the development of the University of the Highlands and Islands with five of its 13 academic partners wholly based on the islands, the common agricultural policy, the minimum wage, the air discount scheme, the introduction of route development funding, the road equivalent tariff, the rural fuel rebate and European structural and investment funds. But whether the policy in question originated in Brussels, at London or Edinburgh, the end result was a win-win for island communities. To echo the EU's Global Europe 2050 vision, policies should not be territorially blind. However, some things have not changed. At a conference that was organised by Shetland Islands Council and the Committee of the Regions, the 2011 Euro Island Study, which analysed island communities across the EU, was debated and discussed. What were the common characteristics? Below average connectivity, GDP below the average of the uh, European average, economic convergence slower, numbers and job and career opportunities low, and services of variable quality and high cost. However, as a counterweight, the 2012 Geospec survey concluded islands of close-knit communities, high value natural capital, and the potential for renewable energy. Perhaps the Minister could share my view that the UK should have joined the other 14 EU countries in the Clean Energy for EU Islands Programme initiative signed by Malt in Malta in 2017.
But the 2012 study also said that islands experience higher vulnerability to climate change through heightening sea levels and increased likelihood of storms. But I believe that the time is right for a new Islands Act that builds on the best practice from Scotland as exemplified by Islands Our Future, which has been mentioned often today and looks to Europe and beyond. Perhaps the best exemplar that I could find, and the Minister is aware of this, uh, for future legislation is the Japanese Remote Islands Development Act of 1953, which all members will be intimately familiar with, which was one of the first acts of legislation in the world to recognise the distinct nature of island communities. As a result of the act, the Japanese island of Okinawa, which is close ties with UHI, became a prefecture, the first level of jurisdiction and administrative division in Japan. Perhaps in winding up, the Minister could comment further in best practice, and I hope he swatted up on the 1953 Act since I last warned him about this particular section. In addition, uh, does the Minister support the plea to have a single public service authority in the islands, which would combine health, local authority and elements of Highlands and Islands enterprise? And nearer to Home Presiding Officer, it's worth stressing there's nothing new in the argument for strengthening our island communities. The Montgomery Committee, which reported in April 1984, recommending consolidating, developing and extending the powers of island councils. And of course, one of the key elements of the Treaty on European Union was the principle of subsidiarity, taking decisions in a localised, decentralised way. And of course, the European Union has always had strong and consistent policies could have special attention to the specific characteristics of territories with serious and permanent handicaps, including islands. Those handicaps are well known to islanders. Limited and costly modes of transport, restricted and declining economic activities, and the fragility of markets and loss of young people. So what would an island's bill look like? Well, of course, as we've said, the template is our islands, our future. However, new powers need new financial muscle. Real devolution means resource-based control, transferring control, of the seabed from the Crown Estate to island authorities and onwards uh, to the community land and harbour trusts. New powers need strategic decision making in planning, designing and commissioning of mainland island ferry services and the recognition of the island status in the Scottish constitutional uh, setup. As well as gaining new powers, we must keep what works well. As the old cliche says, if it ain't broke, why fix it? That's why many of my colleagues across the chamber are so keen to see High's headquarters remain in the Highlands and Islands with a single High Board and Chief Exec and continued decentralisation of our staff to our island authorities. The bigger picture is that we need active Scottish Government and Westminster Government commitment to the relocation of public sector jobs to island communities. For example, Calmac jobs to the Western Isles, Marine Scotland jobs to Shetland, Crown Estate HQ to Orkney is the starter for 10. It's clear there is support for the principle of island proofing to fight isolation, remoteness and peripherality. I will finish spe my speech beside Nostra as I started by quoting Billy Ross in the 1965 debate about Hands and Islands. He said, no part of Scotland has been given a shabbier deal by history from the 45 onwards. Too often, there's been only one way out of troubles for the person born in the Highlands and Islands, emigration. Those who are trusted with carrying out the duties in the New Islands Bill might find themselves involved in the date with history, being part of the history of Scotland. All we need, in the words of Sir Walter Scott, is the will to do and the soul to dare. Thank you. Thank you. I call John Finney to be followed by John Mason. Mr Finney, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And uh, I too would like to thank the various participants who have contributed to this and the, the briefings and indeed our staff. And I'm very grateful to David Stewart, my colleague there. Life's an education and I didn't think I would ever be making a note of the Japanese Remote Islands Act 1953, which will be my bedtime reading tonight. Um, <laughs> Also, a, a lot of a reference has been made to our islands, our future, and it's entirely what politics should be about, in my view. It is about local communities coming together, shared interests, people working to shape policies, and, and all the individuals serving in past who were involved in that are to be commended. And, and it, did, it, it ties in with uh, paragraph four of the uh, government's own policy memorandum, an extract of which says some of the most resilient and supportive communities in Scotland are within islands. And certainly many of us knew that already. And if we had any doubt, that became apparent during uh, many of our visits out. Also goes on to say, however, island communities face challenges around geographic remoteness, declining population, transport and digital connection and other issues. Now, it's, it's also fair to say that some of these are not unique to islands. Um, and people have talked about the challenges in remote areas and, 
uh, Highland and in Argyll and Butte and reference made to the other island, the local authority which has island responsibilities, North Ayrshire. Um, and yes, there's been things that have been a, a most welcome step, RET being one of them. And I was delighted to, to be part of, of uh, something that the Parliament was in agreement indeed, and that was the, the resolution of the issue of the internal ferries funding for the Northern Isles. That's a, another very positive uh, step for the islands. But of course, th there have been the question of expectations that have been uh, given rise to by this, and, and the Minister is fully aware, indeed others have referred to uh, some of these expectations relate relating to remote communities, and uh, Noydert and Scorrig in my own part of the world are both only accessible uh, um, by, by ferry, albeit their mainland. Um, uh, the, the policy memorandum men talked about the, the matters that were consulted upon and the very first one on the list is island proofing and my word we had a lot of discussion about that what that meant and, and the expectations that gave rise to I think there's an opportunity for an element of retrospection and I don't think it means we go back and revisit everything but it, it should be self-evident if there's an ongoing arrangement and we talk for instance uh, the same um, uh, my colleague Lee MacArthur mentioned um, fuel poverty um, if, if a system isn't working then Part of that revisiting it should include iron proofing. So I don't think we never say never. Now, as regards some of the um, parliamentary and indeed local government uh, implications of the bill, I think we have to be alert to some of the unintended consequences. There was a lot of discussions about what the implications could be for ward size and membership and, and makeup. And that was particularly the case where wards straddled both island and mainland communities. So, um, as ever, nothing's ever straightforward, and I, th I think it was colleague Peter Chapman that talked about care homes. Absolutely. I think there's opportunities, and, but they have to be realistic. Every island's not going to have a secondary school. Every island's not going to have a hospital. But collaborative working, uh, and again, I, I think it was David Stewart that talked about uh, asking the Minister his position on a single purpose authority. More collaborative working, as commended by the Christie Commission, that we all talk about, and there's still a long way to go in it, can deliver some of these things. Of course, they have to be viable, and with hospitals, um, that can mean um, uh, the ability to recruit staff um, and the uh, ability to retain staff, and for these staff to have the necessary um, flow of uh, business um, um, through the hospital to maintain their continual professional development. But there are opportunities associated with that too, because we talked in the process of uh, acquiring um, evidence for um, our report, the use of information technology. And that's, that's very much the norm in many parts of uh, the Highlands and Islands. And, um, it's to be commended because what we have to do is we have to grow our population and that's not just in the, in the islands. There was discussion from Community Land Scotland about repopulating the areas cleared. Absolutely. The glens used to be full of people and I would like to see them full of people again. Um, now, turning to, uh, briefly to our report there, um, the local empowerment and devolution of powers. Um, you know, uh, it's the committee supports the empowerment of island communities and devolution of appropriate powers by the Scottish Government. I would hope that's the position, and was our position of everyone in here. It's what things are about. Um, and uh, I think there's debate still to be had about areas covered and what the implications of some of this lesson might be going, going forward. Um, in, in relation to the National Islands Plan, Again, there's a question of expectations there. I'm pleased that there'll be a, an ongoing in, uh, involvement, such involvement for the, the, the local authorities. Um, the, the, there's lots of things in the islands that uh, they, they've always been creative about doing. What they shouldn't have to do is offset some of the implications of decisions that are taken here and indeed elsewhere. So assessment's been talked about, and what we need for assessment is we need evidence. And many of the flawed decisions that are taken at UK level, at Scottish level, indeed local authority level are, because of a, a, an inadequate assessment of what the implications are. In the very short time I've left, I want to uh, talk about uh, one thing that would be very helpful to uh, not only island communities, rural communities, indeed all over the place, and that is if we re resolve the issue of procurement. We, we, we heard uh, on the islands the challenges there of bidding for contracts, yet but that finding that the contracts awarded to one of these very large national uh, uh, organisations and then su subsequently subcontracted, obviously with uh, um, a sum of money removed uh, for local communities. So we need to get uh, um, procurement right. Um, overall, there's uh, a lot of positive, um, more work to be done, and thank you. Thank you very much. I call John Mason to follow by Mike Rumbles. Mr Mason, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I have to say I am delighted to speak uh, on this subject today. 
I'm, I'm not really sure if we are actually meant to enjoy our work uh, in this place, and especially I'm not sure if we're meant to enjoy working on a bill. But I think I have to say that I have uh, not enjoyed previously any other legislation as much as I have uh, working on this particular bill. Scotland's Isles, islands are fantastic, not just for their inhabitants. I believe they are a central part of all of our culture and heritage. The committee, as you've heard, have had a formal meeting in Orkney and a full visit to Mull. Some of us went to Harris and Lewis, and along the way I also managed to get to Skye and Ulva. So I'm particularly delighted that the latter is now moving towards a community buyout. The reality is there was a huge amount of agreement on the committee, and I think amongst islanders and their representatives whom we met as well, that we want to make things better for islands and their communities. And we want this parliament and other organisations to have, have them more at the front of our minds rather than at the back. So we have probably all agreed on some 90% of this bill. However, inevitably, we focus to, today on the 10% where we have questions or reservations. So firstly, a purpose clause for the bill. I do think there is an argument for all or most bills having a purpose clause. When this parliament was re-established, it stated in the act, there shall be a Scottish parliament. Donald Dewar liked that and I like that. And I wonder if there should be room in, it should be more the norm in legislation that we put an emphasis on the principles behind the bill or the act and move away from a traditionally very legalistic approach eh, where the focus is on the actual individual words and the danger is that we in the courts sometimes lose sight of the bigger picture. I do accept there are challenges to including a purpose clause and I have read the government's comments on that. We would have to decide what it should actually be However, something along the lines of our intention is that Scotland should have thriving, I, thriving islands would be the kind of thing I would like. Secondly, island proofing or island impact assessment. In some of our meetings, these phrases were used interchangeably, and this has been mentioned already this afternoon. We spent a bit of time in the committee discussing these two terms and whether they meant the same thing and what message they sent out. To me, island proofing suggests an idea like waterproofing, whereby you're just as dry standing out in the rain because of the waterproof clothing you are wearing. However, that cannot be the case. Living on an island has many benefits as well as many challenges, and it can never be exactly the same as living in a city or even remote mainland. Three, also in island impact assessments, the decision not to fully mitigate. That was something I felt it was important to clarify. We discussed many scenarios around island impact assessments, and what would happen when they were carried out. Clearly what will not happen in every case is that the very same services available in the mainland will be available as well on the islands. John Finney made that point. One example we had was a no care home in Mull. Could it be justified or not? So we asked that if a difference is not to be fully mitigated, for example, not to provide a care home in Mull, then a cost benefit analysis and or an explanation should be given. And I'm glad to see that the government is agreeing to that point. Fourthly, uninhabited islands. The focus of the bill is on island communities and rightly so. However, we have islands which used to be inhabited and are not. St Kilda is probably the most dramatic example and the RSPB has argued for the importance of wildlife on such islands. But to me, St Kilda is much more than a place for birds to feed and to nest. I always wanted to visit St Kilda after reading its story of the struggles the people had before the evacuation in 1930. It is part of our heritage. It is part of our story as a nation. Visiting was one of the most special experiences of my life. So I note the government response that uninhabited islands will be covered in the plan, but I confess to being a little bit disappointed. I do think uninhabited islands deserve some mention in the bill itself. Uh, quickly, yes, I'll. Gail Ross. John Mason for taking an intervention. Does he agree that there are also islands that are inhabited at some times of the year and not at others? John Mason. That's also a valid point, yes, absolutely. Um, and finally, a definition of an island. Uh, having made some comments on this at committee, I think uh, I should also make some comments here about it uh, this afternoon. And I can see Kate Forbes uh, looking at me sharply. As members will have seen, we did hear the argument that remote parts of the mainland, like Ardnamurchan and Cape Wrath, have very similar challenges to islands. However, we were reminded on Mull that if you're seriously ill at night, the only options are a lifeboat or a helicopter. In that respect, islands are different. At least on Skye or Ardnamurchan, it is possible to drive or get an ambulance, albeit the distances and travel times are very great. 
So I personally do agree with the definition of Hamish Haswell Smith, who has written this excellent book uh, on all of Scottish islands, which is that it has to be entirely surrounded by seawater at lowest tide, and there is no permanent means of dry access. But I do accept that that is only one definition, and the defini definition in this bill is a different and a wider one. So I'm sure the government will be glad to hear that I will not be moving an amendment on this point. But I do agree with the wider argument that a very remote part of the mainland, especially like Noydart, eh, which is on the mainland but needs a ferry, it eh, probably does need some similar consideration. Presiding officer, I have really enjoyed working on this bill. I think I have visited 38 of Scotland's islands, by my definition, and I very much want to see a bright future for these key parts of our nation's identity. I think there is room for amendments, but I look forward to the bill passing at stage one tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Mike Rumbles. We follow by Angus Macdonald. Mr Rumbles, please. Well, the Scottish Liberal Democrats welcome the fact that we have before us an Islands Bill and are supportive of it. This should come as no surprise, of course, since we said in our manifesto in the 2016 election that we would, and I quote, introduce an Islands Act to island-proof all legislation to give Scottish ministers the right to issue guidance to public authorities as to the way they can vary national services to make them more suitable for islands subject to local authority consent. Now, the Liberal Democrats would therefore have been somewhat more robust in an islands bill that we would have laid before the Parliament, but of course, we welcome what is before us today from the Scottish Government. Members of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee took a great deal of evidence, as we've heard, when we examined the bill, and, and by the way, um, I think it's a testament to the constructive approach of all 11 members of the committee that we were able to agree a unanimous report. And I hope the minister takes this on board at stage two uh, when he brings forward amendments to the bill. Because I think it's always, always more effective if the minister brings forward the amendments, which we can then all support. We heard from islanders themselves and indeed other stakeholders that they would have liked the bill to contain objectives. We've heard that already identified in the bill, which would have given the legislative legislation greater purpose and focus. However, we've also heard the government decline to do this as we, uh, instead of uh, uh, wanting to put those issues in the National Islands Plan, which will be published sometime after we have finished examining this legislation. So as MSPs, whose job it is to interrogate this legislation, we must do it without, obviously, without the sight of the government's plan. So in, in our view, that's not a good start. One of our main concerns within this bill is on the issue of island proofing. Our worry, and others have mentioned this too, is that the government may be raising expectations amongst islanders that every service change from the 66, 66 public bodies mentioned in the bill will mean that these bodies must adapt their plans to meet the needs of islanders. There is no, as we've heard, extra public money being made available, and we're not requesting that it is, but that, that's a fact. There's no extra public money being made available to islanders as a result of the bill. What that means, however, is that all 66 public bodies that affect the lives of our islanders must show how they've taken account of the special circumstances of the islands when they make policy decisions. Now, one of the most important concerns when I, uh, when I have discussed this bill with islanders themselves is that they say that this process of island proofing and indeed the impact assessments must not under any circumstance turn into a simple tick box exercise. And that came over time and time and time again. I foresee this as a major issue which should have been addressed in the legislation. We should have a clear process, and we would have liked to have done this as, a, as the Liberal Democrats outlined in our manifesto, a clear process outlined by which these 66 bodies should conduct these impact assessments. What we cannot have, for instance, is a board member sitting in an office in the central belt filling in a form to say that he or she has considered the impact of such and such a policy on the islands and is proceeding with it anyway. Now, what we need is a clear direction from the government as to exactly, exactly how these public bodies should approach the impact assessments when island proofing their policies. Indeed, in the committee's recommendations, it says that the guidance produced by the Scottish Government must require those conducting an impact assessment to make it clear the ways in which the views of local people will be incorporated into the decision-making process. That doesn't necessarily mean that those public bodies must do what is said, but they must make it clear why they're doing, uh, having a particular uh, 
policy or why they can't do something. While the Scottish Government, in its response to the Committee's report, does say that it welcomes this recommendation, it goes on to say that it doesn't wish to be prescriptive about this. Now, that's the point. I think we're missing an opportunity here. There are some other missed opportunities in the Bill, one of which is, of course, the lack of a specific section in the Bill dealing with the retrospective island proofing of legislation. And as colleagues have said, we don't necessarily have to throw open the doors to every aspect of legislation, but there should be a process within the Bill where aspects of previous legislation can be looked at. Of course. Uh, Minister. Thank you. I thank Mike Rumbles for giving way. I will address this in my closing uh, in more detail, but uh, does he have a, a piece of legislation that he wishes us to retrospectively look at uh, that perhaps we can engage in and, and have a conversation in and around? Mike Rumbles. Welcome that very constructive uh, suggestion. My two colleagues, Liam MacArthur and Tavis Scott, certainly do, and um, we'll be coming to see him uh, as a result of that kind invitation. <laughs> I know that James Stockton... <laughs> I know that James Stockton, leader of the Orkney Islands Council, believes that a section on retrospective island proofing, amongst other things, would make a profound difference. He does, a profound difference to their island communities and would enhance the historic piece of legislation. And what we all want to see, we want to see this historic piece of legislation transforming communities. We want to make it transformational and we don't want to miss this opportunity. So the Scottish Liberal Democrats welcome the bill, will support it, However, we do believe it can be improved and we'll aim, hopefully, with the Minister to do just that at stages two and three of the legislative process. Thank you. Thank you. I call Angus MacDonald to be followed by Donald Cameron. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you, President Officer. I should refer members to my register of interests. I, I own a non-domestic property in the Corn and Yellen Chair uh, Local Authority area. Uh, I'm pleased to be contributing to this debate on the Island of Scotland Bill, uh, given that I was born and bred on the Isle of Lewis, uh, where my family have farmed over 400 acres just outside that great metropolis of Stornoway uh, for nearly 100 years, uh, and where I've seen at first hand the challenges faced by business, especially our own family firms, which involved wholesale and retail butchering and livestock auctioneering. It's always been a challenge to farm in the Outer Hebrides, being faced with the double whammy of Atlantic gales and transport costs, and running successful businesses there is no mean feat either. However, there have been welcome measures taken by successive governments over the years to make life for island businesses easier. For example, our cattle lorries could travel one way on the ferry free as long as they were empty, which helped reduce the added burden we had uh, to face of uh, transporting livestock to and from the island. The same applied to any lorries we had coming over from the mainland with livestock feed or hay and straw. Now, these measures were very, all very welcome, but not enough to stop us throwing in the towel in the mid-2000s when we closed down our auction mart. However, we didn't leave the crofters high and dry. We provided a purposely set up crofters cooperative with the land to build a new auction mart, which they secured HIE funding for. Uh, we also closed down our wholesale and retail butchering businesses around the same time, faced with transport costs, supermarket competition in Stornoway, and more and more excessive red tape. The scunner factor had well and truly set in. And given the reported challenges Brexit will bring to sheep farming in the Highlands and Islands, the days of the family farms in Stornoway may well be numbered too. So, presiding officer, I think it's fair to say that the Islands Bill is coming along just at the right time, uh, and coupled with the Communities Empowerment Act, the Land Reform Act, a hopefully forthcoming crofting bill expected during this session of Parliament. The Crown Estate Scotland bill just tabled a couple of weeks ago, and along with accelerated provision of high-speed broadband, there is hope that decline in the Inner and Outer Hebrides can be reversed. However, that said, I agree with the convener of uh, the REC Committee, Edward Mountain's view, that this is not a panacea which will solve all our island's challenges. And I have to say... Um, uh, will not exempt the islands from a lot of the pain that we'll all feel uh, post-Brexit. So the REC Committee is correct when it states in its Stage 1 report that the Scottish Government will need to manage the expectations of islanders who may expect more immediate tangible outcomes to be delivered from the Act. That's, uh, however, that's why the planned island proofing element of the Bill is so important. It's vitally important that it's not a token provision and I think it's doubly important that Scottish ministers should have the power to issue statutory guidance to other relevant public bodies, which those bodies would have to adhere to, 
in exercising their functions and duties. And as Corlin Yellen Sear has suggested, the statutory guidance should be entrenched in the process for decisions in a similar manner to that utilised to fulfil the public sector equality duty, which I believe would be an appropriate way to proceed. Corlin Yellen Sear make specific the suggestion that the duty should apply to all public bodies unless a particular public body can satisfy Scottish ministers that the duty is not relevant to its functions. Island proofing should apply to the development of any policy or law within the competence of the Scottish Parliament and of course it should be hoped and expected that the UK Government adopts similar guidance for consideration of policies reserved to Westminster and the agencies which have a remit in Scotland. A current and salient exa example of this is the proposal of the UK Government, uh, by the UK Government to ban live animal exports. Such a ban would have a devastating effect on livestock producers in the Western Isles, as well as, I'm sure, uh, the Northern Isles. By necessity, livestock travelling from the Outer Hebrides to the mainland due to ferry timings and storm delays can often be on trucks longer, they can often be on trucks longer than livestock crossing the English Channel. While that situation is far from ideal, it's the only way for island producers to get their stock to markets or send to better pasture for finishing. So I was delighted to see the Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing's strong stance on this issue a couple of days ago when he said that, and I quote, this was one UK-wide framework that the Scottish Government would not be participating in, end quote. But that's a prime example of how, without island proofing, the economy of the islands and the livelihoods of crofters and farmers could be severely disadvantaged. And I note, uh, President Officer, that uh, you yourself are attempting to bring a member's debate on this issue to the Chamber and I look forward to uh, that taking place if your motion secures cross-party support. And needless to say, I haven't signed it. <laughs> in evidence to the committee... Can I just remind the member, I'm in the chair, so I am silenced. Okay. But inside, I'm not silenced. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's noted, President Officer. Um, in evidence to the committee, there was also uh, what I thought a pertinent argument put forward by Community Land Scotland, which calls for a key question to be asked when new policy and law is being considered as to whether the, the devolution of more power to the Islands Council as well as councils with islands it would be potentially advantageous to the governance and sustainability uh, of those areas. I think there's merit in that argument and I hope it will be considered during the development of the National Islands Plan which I understand will be laid before Parliament within 12 months of the Act coming into force. Um, Presiding Officer, there are so many aspects to this bill that it's impossible to cover them all in the time available. I hope I've given a, a, a sense of, of where I'm coming from on it. However, suffice to say, uh, I wish the REC committee well for stage two and look forward to the bill returning to the chamber for stage three. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. MacDonald. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr. Cameron, please. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate at stage one of the Islands Bill. I note that it marks a significant step towards real island devolution. One of the great aspects of being a Highlands and Islands MSP is the ability to represent islanders here in Parliament. And having been to Isla and Lewis uh, within the last month with another visit to Lewis tomorrow, I'm acutely aware of what this bill could do for these communities. And I have to commend the REC committee on their visits uh, across the islands. Uh, they have certainly succeeded in, in getting people talking, at least the people that I've uh, met in, in the last months or so. From the outset, I'd like to join others in thanking the island councils and the communities within those islands for all their work in help, helping to bring this bill to fruition. Um, it was their persistence, principally through the Our Islands, Our Future campaign that others have mentioned, that drove this government to deliver on this. And it is because of their efforts that we are having this debate and why it's so important that they are still involved in the process as we go forward. I've argued in this chamber before against the, the centralising agenda of the SNP government, and it is refreshing to see for once this government looking to devolve power away from the centre and deliver real support for our island communities. And, and as others have said, it, it is crucial that we make sure that this is not simply a box-ticking exercise. And uh, the, the phrase tick-box exercise has been used by many, in, 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 many people in a way it's been overused, um, but it does say something very important because... This legislation must be meaningful. It must strengthen and support those in our most remote areas. And it is important that we lay the groundwork for a national islands plan that can build on this bill and deliver real and tangible change. And 
Mike Rumbles gave a very vivid image of uh, someone in uh, the central belt just filling in a form. We cannot allow that to happen. It, it has to be meaningful. Um, the REC committee has made a recommendation to the government that the six local authorities with island interests be made statutory consultees in the development of, of a national islands plan. And I can um, support that in, in so far as it's essential to guarantee that at the centre of this process are the island communities who inspired this action and whom the bill and plan seek to benefit. Uh, that recommendation also recognises uh, another point, which others again have made, which is that while much of this debate is rightly centred on those three island authorities who have driven the process, we need to be aware that they are not the only local authorities in Scotland who have islands uh, and who face complex needs. In um, the Highlands and Islands region, which I represent, our Garland Butte has some 23 inhabited islands, the largest of any local authority in Scotland, and Highland Council contains 15 inhabited islands, according to the last census. Indeed, as uh, I think um, um, John Finney mentioned, there are many mainland areas uh, w um, that are in some ways like islands. They have peninsulas or, or, or parts of the country that are, are very far away. Um, and that is a point that I'm glad to see the REC committee made. I think it was a final recommendation uh, in, in their report. And although all of these councils that have islands are administered uh, from, uh, from the mainland and the bulk of their populations may be in mainland settlements, we must not forget that they face very similar issues to the three island uh, authorities. And as council colleagues who represent island communities uh, across, the, across the political spectrum regularly tell me, they often struggle to implement many of the changes directed by government. Uh, and like the island, three island authorities, they find it difficult to do things such as funding care for the elderly, providing additional support needs to the most vulnerable, uh, and assist children as they transition from primary to secondary education. Um, it's also important to note the diversity of all these councils that cover both large uh, urban populations and, and remote island communities. And when we talk about island proofing, um, we must be able to fit that to the unique uh, complexities of all the uh, authorities that have islands within them. Because as the REC report states, the success of this bill will be determined by the practical difference, the practical difference that it makes to individual communities. And that is the, the, the central point. That is how it will be judged. Um, islanders that I know are independent-minded and robust in their views, and they will be frank and honest if it does make no practical difference. So uh, island proofing is, is clearly a step in, in the right uh, direction. Others have spoke about um, making, uh, there's a strong case at least for retrospective uh, impact assessments, and I hope the, the government takes heed of those calls. Uh, because after all, how can we implement substantial change to our island communities if we only island proof new legislation? And I, I do believe the government needs to look at uh, relevant past legislation and determine whether it is fit for the islands too. That's no mean feat, uh, but if we um, want to get this right, then we must um, attempt it. Um, beyond the intricacies of the bill, uh, many members have mentioned the difficulties facing islanders uh, today. Um, an ageing population, high delivery charges, high building costs, high fuel costs, and, and far too many premises still to be connected to, to broadband. But one of the issues that a, a lot of um, island uh, communities mentioned to me is the, the risk of depopulation. Um, and Argyll and Butte has a particular um, problem here, and reversing that trend must be at the heart of this legislation. Uh, on the plan, it is incumbent upon all of us to heed the call of... Yes, indeed. Cabinet Secretary. I'm very grateful for Ms Cameron giving way. So far as broadband is concerned, uh, uh, he knows that we have a £600 million scheme, uh, uh, R100, almost all of which is funded by the Scottish Government, the UK proposing to contribute 3%. Would he join with uh, us and this part of the Chamber and Government in calling on the UK Government to increase that from the measly, pathetic 3% of the total? Donald Cameron. I'm not going to rise, rise to the bait, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, what I would say is that, what I would say, what I would say is that I've spoken to a business that moved to the Western Isles, wanted to set up uh, their business there. They could do it anywhere, and they had to, um, after a couple of years, uh, move away because they didn't have um, enough of a good signal and quality broadband. That's the reality, uh, Minister. Um, to, to close with, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, I welcome the intentions of this bill and I sincerely thank the efforts of local authorities in driving it forward. And it is essential that these 
Legislative provisions do not become empty words, and the Scottish Government needs to clarify the overarching aim of the plan and to incorporate the local councils who have already worked so hard in developing it um, and ensure that this is a meaningful, part, um, uh, meaningful bill for all our island communities. Thank you. Thank you. I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Mr Thank McGregor, you. please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, and as a non-declaration of interest, I can say that there's no islands in my constituency, but I am a mem member of the REC committee, and I'd like to thank, as others have done, the clerks and all who gave evidence during the stage one um, evidence gathering. And I particularly enjoyed being given the opportunity to visit Mill and hear firsthand how this bill may positively impact on communities there. And that was the only uh, island visit that I managed to go on. We have had much groundbreaking legislation in this parliament recently, and this bill is certainly in that category. It aims to offer greater powers to the island local authorities and meet the specific challenges of their communities. There are a whole host of issues facing our island communities, including depopulation, housing, transport and jobs. We must accept that cha the challenges in addressing these are different from facing similar issues on the mainland, and that's why we need this bill. The bill includes giving island councils powers over activities on and around their coastlines, and the hope is that communities therein can benefit from greater empowerment. And I welcome the positive contribution for the, from the island authorities, many who have fought for a long time for more powers. And some of the main principles of the bill include the creation of the National Islands Plan, has been uh, discussed, which sets out the main objectives and strategy of the Scottish Government, greater flexibility around council of representation within island communities, and I believe my colleague Richard Lyle is going to talk a bit more about that, and extended powers to island councils in relation to marine licensing. And I want to co concentrate on a couple of areas. Tourism, firstly, which is probably most relevant to me. I recall my first trip to Skye many years ago, and I do say that Skye is an island, and it's a clear weekend, beautiful scenery, eagles flying in, in, the, in the sky above. And a Sunday, finding it very difficult to find any shops open or even get fuel in the car. So all new experiences then. So as a member of the committee, what do I hope that it will be the benefit of the bill on tourism? Better transport accessibility should increase tourism. People can fall in love with these places such as Sky and want to stay there, helping with depopulation issues. The £6 million Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund that was announced by the First Minister in October to support sustainable growth in rural tourism across Scotland. And the latest figures indicate notable increases in visitor numbers to rural tourism sites, and I'm, I'm pleased with that. And, you know, I, I know that Sky is one of those, and, and there was actually a lot of bad press about that, which I have to confess I didn't totally understand um, the, the reasons for that. I thought that would have been a good thing, but um, if that's not the case, I stand corrected. And, and of course, we've got the Outlander effect, as it's called, um, going on at the moment, um, where people are visiting a uh, historic environment, Scotland sites. Um, also, we've touched a wee bit on the broadband issue, uh, and it's talked about a lot in here and at, and at the REC committee. And I think by achieving better connectivity, by delivering broadband and making it faster, where it already exists, uh, we can have, um, this will allow more scope for people to run sustainable businesses, and business br brings people uh, and that is all good for island communities. The SNP, of course, will now build on earlier successes and through the R100 programme and a £600 million commitment help deliver a future-proofed national fibre network that will make rural Scotland one of the best connected places anywhere in Europe and underpin future economic growth. And by the end of 2021, Scotland will be the only part of the UK where every single home and business can be accessed by, can access to professional broadband and a commitment to all our communities. It's worth also mentioning, presiding officer, equality. Say, in the committee report, uh, welcomes the potential of the bill to improve equalities. And through our evidence sessions, we heard about issues of occupational segregation between men and women on islands, and issue of equality for the LGBT communities. On Brexit, we didn't actually take a lot of evidence, but again, there are question marks hanging over the states of EU citizens who work in our tourism and other sectors. And in human rights, you know, there was a discussion about lack of nursing homes, foster placements. What, what do people do when they, when they need these uh, services? Often they need to, to leave the islands for their home. But I think it's also worth mentioning how we, we viewed uh, the whole scrutiny of the bill. My colleague Jenny Gilruth is on record in the chamber here uh, mentioning that the committee is mainly male, apart from the, the deputy convener, uh, Gail Ross. Um, so I think it is worth recognising that we scrutinised this bill 
through that context, and I think it's just worth acknowledging and simply reflecting on that. President officer, you'll know that uh, in every debate, I always take some time to talk about my own constituency, and it may seem from the outside that there is no link between this bill and Cobridge and Chrysan, but this, in my opinion, is in fact untrue. One of the themes that came out uh, was how many of the issues were also faced in rural mainland, and know Gail Ross and others have talked about that. Uh, and although the challenges, as I've said, are, are different, this initiative of bill can perhaps lead the way and teach us about how we proof all our communities. As someone born and raised in the largest and urban part of my constituency, Cope Bridge, I've made it my business uh, since the election to get to understand the village communities that make up the Christon part of the constituency name. And there are some striking similarities to what we heard in the islands, all these small villages, Steps, Christon, Moodysburn, Gatkosh, Glenboig, and Muirhead, with fairly small populations, have very unique identities and passionate communities, and they also have very unique issues. From some so shocking poverty and health stats on working class Moodysburn, home to the Oaken Geek Miners Memorial Site, to ironically having very little in the way of health and leisure facilities, and a feeling they've been let, left out in the transfer of the health boards, to more affluent steps where many older people live are being stripped of the last bank in town by RBS, to closure of the only care home covering the whole village area. And perhaps in these towns, though, there is an issue of expansion rather than depopulation, such as in Gapkosh, as it, and we maybe need to think about how village identities can be maintained and people's voices heard. The list could go on, President Officer, but my overall point... No, it can't, because you're at your six the, minutes, Mr oh, McGregor. Sorry, is, I was just going to finish by saying the Islands Bill can be a leader in this for all communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Kate Forbes. Mr thank MacDonald, please. Thank you very much. Action to support Scotland's islands is a good thing, but we do need to be clear about what kind of action uh, and which islands. That is why part one of this bill is important. Definitions do matter. No amount of detailed provision will achieve the desired effect if the definitions fail to make clear where the law will apply or if they apply too narrowly. I might mention the High Hedges Act as a recent example of such a failure, but that is for another day. This bill's definition of an island, as we have heard, is now uncontroversial, and that's good. The problem is that the bill makes a distinction in law between inhabited and uninhabited islands, which in the context of the history and culture of Scotland's islands is both unnecessary and undesirable. New legal categories of inhabited island, permanently inhabited island, and island communities are not required to deliver the policy purposes of the bill, and island communities are not defined by counting heads. Take the Isle of Harris, for example, which I know well. It is a permanently inhabited island with a very strong sense of identity and community, but the community of Harris does not stop at its beaches, fabulous though so many of them are. The inhabited islands of Scalpay and Burnrae Harris are strong communities in their own right. They more than meet the criteria in this bill, but they are also part of the community of Herrachs, of Harris people, and they are seen as such both by the people who live there and by the people who live in Harris itself. And that wider community does not stop there. Tarensai and Scarp and Ense and St Kilda all ceased to be permanently inhabited in the 20th century. Papai was cleared for sheep in the 19th. That does not mean that they have ceased to be islands with a history and culture of their own, nor does it mean that they have ceased to be part of the wider community of Harris. St Kilda is well known. It is a World Heritage Site belonging to the National Trust for Scotland, which works to conserve and protect the natural environment and the cultural heritage of the St Kilda Islands in partnership with Scottish Natural Heritage and the Minister of Defence. Tarrensay hit the nation's television screens with the series Castaway, one of the first and certainly one of the best reality TV series uh, of this century. Scarp is famous for the experiment in Rocket Post in the 1930s, when people still live there all year round. Papai and Ensai are less well known, but they are still included in the common grazings of crofters in Harris. A definition of islands communities which excludes any or all of those islands would not reflect the community of Harris as understood by Herax. And an islands plan which covered Burnley but not Ensai would fail to address the challenges our islands face in a holistic and joined up way. It is misguided, too, to create a legal category of permanently inhabited island. 
The Law Society objects that there is no such concept in Scots law and proposes ordinary residence instead. But in fact, neither of those constraints on the application of this bill is either necessary or useful. As far as local council wards are concerned, people included in the register of electors would count, so there is no need for further definition there. But if there are permanently inhabited islands, then by implication there are permanently uninhabited islands too. And that is a, mo a notion which most islanders would strongly reject. If Harris Crofters can land their sheep in Ainsey, then that island is within the scope of human habitation, even if there's no one living there at this moment in time. When I went out to the Shant Islands on a fast rib last summer, there were clothes drying on a line next to a house on what this bill will by default define as an uninhabited island. What is true for Harris and its satellite islands is surely true for all the island groups from Shetland to the Firth of Clyde. Island plans which could include only permanently inhabited islands and exclude their neighbours would not properly deal with whole island groups or, or with island communities. For example, as I mentioned to the Minister in his opening remarks, the policy intention of this bill is said to be to extend the provisions of the Settlement County Council Act to other island local authorities. But in fact, it limits island licensing areas to areas including an inhabited island. I can find no such limitation in the terms of the Settlement County Council Act, which means that this bill potentially reduces the scope of that act within the Shetland Islands, never mind extending it to other island areas. Neither human habitation nor the lack of it defines an island, nor should depopulation ever be defined by this parliament as permanent. Islands which have been emptied of people can be inhabited again, as Battersea has been. Where that has not been achieved, it is often still the aspiration of those who once lived there or of their descendants. To maximize the future potential for living communities in our islands, we should plan for each and all of our island groups as whole groups, not only for the currently inhabited parts. If we take that approach, we can also envis envisage them in a holistic way from the point of view of nature conservation, protecting native from invasive species, and maximizing the tourism and economic potential of all our islands, inhabited or otherwise. A national islands plan must cover all our islands, those which are inhabited only in the summer, as well as those inhabited all year round, and those which are currently uninhabited too. That way, we can really deliver the step change in support for our island communities, which they need and deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms MacDonald. I call Kate Forbes, be followed by Jamie Halker johnson Ms Forbes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our islands are not mini-museums or visitor centres or somebody's play park. They are homes for the most part. And it has never been so important to promote islanders' voices, to harness islands' resources and to enhance the well-being of island communities. We talk about remoteness, but islands are not so much remote from Edinburgh as Edinburgh and London are remote from the islands. And that's why the term island proofing that's been used frequently in this debate is so important as islanders face changes, changes in healthcare, education and public services, as they develop the huge renewable energy potential of their natural resources, and as they use community empowerment legislation and the 10 million pounds of community land fund to turn their ideas into reality. And all of that has one aim as I see it, and that is, to reverse the trend of depopulation from the islands. One of the greatest challenges, for example, remains recruiting and retaining staff in public services and also enabling private businesses to grow by giving them access to talent pools. Just yesterday, the UK government blocked a Canadian Gaelic teacher from coming to Scotland and starting her new job as a primary school teacher on the Isle of Mull after the role was vacant for six months. There are serious questions about recruitment and retention, about skills and talent pools, and the last thing we should be doing is clamping down on immigration. One size does not fit all. Highland Council does what it can in an area the size of Belgium, and with a coastline that, including Ireland, is over 20% of Scotland's total coastline. 
But changes rubber stamped in Inverness, in Edinburgh and in London have got to recognise the geography of our island communities where ferry timetables and stormy weather and long distances have got to be factored in. This bill is needed because decision making is not always sufficiently island proofed currently. And I'd like to give two negative examples followed by two positive examples of where it works. If we take healthcare, for example, I have been fighting for overnight out of hours cover on the Isle of Razi for almost two years since I was elected. But NHS Highland has still not recruited somebody to cover those out of hours overnight period on an island whose link to the mainland ceases to exist at 6 p.m. every night when the ferry stops running and it doesn't recommence until the next morning. It's not possible to hop in the car and get help. It's not always possible for emergency services to dock or to land in stormy weather. So why is there still no out of hours overnight cover on the Isle of Razi? And then over the water to sky, where island residents in the far north depend on an out of hours urgent care on Portree. But despite the hard work and dedication of doctors and nurses there, the too frequent suspension of out of hours cover in Portree is not acceptable because it's not sustainable. Uh, before I move on to the two positive examples, I'll take an intervention from Edward Mountain. Edward Mountain. Uh, I'd like to thank the member for, for, for giving way. And I'd also like to make it absolutely clear that I, I speak as an individual, not as I did earlier in the debate as, as convener of the REC committee. One of the things about islands and moving to islands and living on islands and having contracts on islands for people to live there is the very fact that it requires a huge commitment from families. And therefore, to do that and to achieve that, surely part of the island proofing process must be to make sure that contracts are sufficiently long term to attract people. And, and that's one of the messages I believe that we should be getting across. Kate Forbes. I agree with that. I think contracts have got to be long term. There has got to be decent salaries, but also um, concern needs to be given to alternative jobs in an island community. And again, I do think it goes back to clamping down on immigration because a lot of those who are working in our health service have come from beyond the UK and we should be actively recruiting people with the necessary skills in education and in healthcare to come and move to our islands, as we saw with a very effective recruitment campaign for um, the Isle of Muck. Now, this government uh, has a good track record in adapting policy to islands and to rural communities, like the £5 million island housing fund, which is complementing the £25 million rural housing fund. And that is so vitally important because the gap between average incomes and average house prices is too wide on our remote communities. That's not helped by the high number of holiday homes in particular. Our island residents know the meaning of the word resilience. The people of Muck, Rum, Canna, Egg, Razi and Skye, to name just a few, have known it for centuries. Now, I'm sympathetic to John Scott's point about including remote and rural parts about the mainland, of the mainland too, with my family coming from Applecross. And I want to close with a, a brief story that could just as easily be applied to islands about how governments can make or break communities by investing in or ignoring them. In August 1883, in a village near Applecross, my great-great-grandfather appeared before the Napier Commission to plead for a road. He told the commissioners about 400 people living in the 12 villages of the north coast of the peninsula with three primary schools, but there was no road. They promised to build it themselves, they promised to raise their rents, but the government would not build them a road. And in the next 100 years, people left and the schools closed. And finally, in the 1970s, a bulldozer appeared to blast through the rock as government funds were finally found to build a road because the Ministry of Defence needed the inner sound for a torpedo range. And that is history, but that is the context to this bill. And that is why I believe that this bill is making history. Thank you. I call Jamie Halker Johnson, we followed by Richard Lyle, and Mr. Halker Johnson is the penultimate speaker in the open debate. Oh, good. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, as an MSP representing the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, and as an Orcadian myself, I'd like to welcome the, uh, welcome the introduction of the Islands Bill and the commencement of its legislative process. 
I'd also like to extend my thanks to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee for their stage one report and the scrutiny work that they have undertaken. Scotland's island communities are distinct societies with distinct identities within Scotland and the wider United Kingdom. These communities have long histories, intertwined with but often separate from Scotland as a whole. I was only four years old when my family moved home to Orkney in 1979, and even since then there is no question that the islands have changed. We've welcomed many newcomers to our shores over the centuries, and they have made a huge and positive contribution to island life. But our rich and distinct island heritage has not been lost. And importantly, it needs to be recognized, cherished, and protected. In one way, this bill is unusual. It's not brought at the behest of a political party, but results from the campaigning of the island's representatives themselves. And I welcome this work, led by the island authorities, particularly through our Islands Our Future campaign, in raising the particular needs of these communities up the political agenda at both Scottish and at UK level. It is fundamental to any attempt to build and expand local democracy that communities are involved from the outset and that their views and our views are taken into account throughout the process. A key part of this island's agenda will be the agreement of a coherent and robust national islands plan by the Scottish Government. The bill enables this, but does not develop it. The island's agenda will be an ongoing one, and it must, be, it must receive the attention and resources that it merits in the coming months and years. As mentioned by my colleague Edward Mountain, speaking on behalf of the committee, the islands each have their own individual identities. And I support the broad objective of the committee in ensuring that local authorities also have island level planning. We often speak of the islands facing challenges in the delivery of public services, the availability of local employment, local infrastructure, and in ensuring the sustainability of these communities for generations ahead. In that, as my colleagues John, my colleagues John Scott and Gail Ross has also mentioned, they share many of the issues faced by remote and rural communities in mainland Scotland too where public services may be distant and connectivity may be poor. In this way, the island serves a helpful reminder that policy decisions made in Edinburgh must work not just for the populated central belt or the lowlands, but for Scotland in its entirety. The bill's commitment to island impact, ass impact assessments is welcome and expectations are high that the Scottish Government and the 66 public bodies referenced in the bill will take full notice of the outcome of these assessments and address the need to, mitig need to mitigate policy choices that may have a negative effect on island communities. In its response to the committee, the Scottish Government also outlined that it accepted in principle that assessment of policies on a retrospective basis could take place where specific issues are highlighted. Additional clarity on how such mechanism could be triggered would be welcome from ministers. Because it, is, because it is clear that there are policy decisions where the islands have, have been held back. We know from recent figures that the, ins, the islands lack seriously behind mainland Scotland and the rest of the UK in access to broadband as well as 4G connectivity. And yet these are communities where in many cases the benefits of these types of connectivity could be greater than mainland communities. The wider point is that the impact must not, only, must not simply be interpreted as examining where islands are disadvantaged by change, but also where they are left behind when change is being implemented on mainland communities. Within the island authorities, there are often additional issues faced by the smaller islands, particularly in Orkney and Shetland. I'm concerned that insufficient attention has been paid in these cases, where public services can often be at their most distant. Sometimes the wrong sort of investment can be a problem. During a trip to Westry in 2016, Westry being one of Orkney's islands, some residents told me that the broadband rollout has left them with a less reliable and slower service than the satellite connections they had been encouraged to move away from before. Island level planning, as I mentioned previously, is one solution, but equally islands need to be, must need uh, to be considered as part of a wider planning from the Scottish Government. As Kate Forbes mentioned on health, I spoke at the end of last year with the Cabinet, uh, with the Cabinet Secretary for Health on the challenges facing Strong's GP practice, where NHS Orkney suspended the resident medical team and reduced the service pending review. These sorts of services are vital, and their importance should be understood across all tiers of government. The private sector is, of course, a key provider of services to islands. While Orkney and Shetland have not been affected by the, the current round of RBS closures, we often see businesses and residents struggling when key services move away. The committee certainly recognised that the Scottish Government cannot place requirements on the private sector, although the, the government's response contains some welcome points on procurement. But I would suggest that ministers could, in some cases, assess the access to such services as part of the wider view of island communities and their sustainability. 
This can affect both how public services ought to be delivered, as well as highlight opportunities where the Scottish Government may be able to exert influence to positive effect. Presiding officer, there is hope on the islands that this bill can serve as a first step in give, give, giving greater recognition to the priorities of island communities at the heart of government. While I have joined with colleagues and, and the committee in noting a number of concerns and areas where further detail would be helpful, the bill remains a positive starting point for these discussions. Thank you very much. I call Richard Lyle, then we'll move to closing speeches. Mr Lyle, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to contribute to Stage 1 debate on the Islands Bill, particularly as a member of the Rural Affairs Connectivity Committee, which takes a keen interest in the areas which the Bill should address. Can I pay tribute to all who gave evidence, the clerks, the committee convener, the committee members, and, of course, the Minister Hamza Yusuf. I'd like to begin this afternoon by reflecting on, frankly, how historic this bill shall be and can be in addressing the unique needs of Scotland's islands now and indeed in the future, which I hope shall create the right environment for sustainable growth and, importantly, empower communities. The development of this bill has had many milestones, and I believe it's only right to acknowledge the work of the government in getting us to where we are now particularly the work done by the Island Area Ministerial group, Working Group, who responded to the Our Islands, Our Future campaign in 2013 from Orkney and Shetland Island Councils and Western Isles Council. 2020, uh, two, in 2014, they published the Empowering Scotland's Island Communities Prospectus, which confirmed a commitment to principles of subsidiarity and local governance. Prospectus was a series of measures unanimously endorsed by the members of the Island Areas Ministerial Working Group, which reflected those principles and ensured that these decisions best determined by island communities were made by those who know them best, the island communities themselves. And these measures were developed based on three fundamental objectives, promoting the voices of the islanders, harnessing island resources, and enhancing the well-being of our island communities. Then, presiding officer, in November of that same year, the government fulfilled that commitment made in empowering Scotland Island Communities Prospectus. I believe this government continues to provide a focus on these issues, most, most important to all of Scotland's island communities and a voice for them at the centre of Scottish Government. Moreover, it was a key commitment in the SNP manifesto in 2016 that we would consult on and bring forward an Islands Bill to reflect the unique needs of these communities and implement our 10-point manifesto for our islands. In addition, the government announced in our programme for government of that year to help the islands build a more prosperous and fairer future for their communities. They, that we would introduce an islands bill and a new island strategic group would meet for the first time in autumn to begin its work on the creation of a national islands plan. I think it's therefore indeed an historic moment today as this bill can be thought of as a key point of culmination in many efforts over the years by this SNP government to deliver our island communities. But of course, we shall always continue to do more and deliver the best outcomes for all Scotland's communities. That's why the SNP have already invested six million in the Rural Tourist Fund, which was announced by the First Minister in October, to su support sustainable growth in rural <laughs> tourism throughout Scotland including especially, especially our island communities. We have heard from the Cabinet Secretary in the Budget a further commitment to help deliver for our island communities and the funding that has been assigned. Of course, as a member of the Rural Affairs Committee, I was delighted that the Committee recommended to Parliament the agreement of the general principles of the Bill, and the consideration of this Bill meant the opportunity for members uh, to visit areas. I took part in visits to Mull and Orkney, as well as engaging digitally with islanders on Arran and the Uni University of Islands, uh, Highlands and Islands. All of this engagement by the committee helped better understand the contact, context which this legislation before Parliament sits in. I'm particularly pleased that there is a proposal to look at improved councillor representation for islands. I'm sure that this will be looked at closely as the bill progresses and I hope the Boundary Commission will work closely with local authorities that have islands to ensure that these islands have the number of councillors they richly deserve. Having previously 
I've been a councillor for 36 years. I'm reminded that actually I was a councillor one year before Mr. Halcold Johnson uh, was, was born. Um, uh, I, uh, I know the needs of constituents require attention daily. Islands must have the rep representation they deserve in order to represent, yes, I look young for my age, and to re represent their needs in the local authority. There is a suggestion that island uh, councillors may have a closer working arrangement with the council administration, which many would welcome, and I do hope that will be the case. I'm also particularly pleased that the record support for Scotland's island overseen by this SNP government as we work to tackle the many changes and challenges faced by island communities. Of course, that work can only be done as it has been. We work in partnership, not only with island communities, but with their local authorities and organisations to support the delivery of policy and change. Local authority partners and Scottish Government working together has shown that we can work together, we can deliver positive outcomes in all our communities. I want to conclude, President Officer, by considering how the ambitions of the bill shall be delivered this bill requires a government island-proof future legislation and policies. That means that by law our island communities will not be forgotten again and will always be a voice. Scottish ministers and other relevant public bodies will be required to take into account the interests of, of island communities and I believe that we will do that uh, and I hope and wish this bill, bill well. Thank you. Thank you very much Mr Lyle. And I call Rhoda Grant to close for Labour. See, you've got my call, Ms Grant. Well, it's not mine, it's going round. Uh, six minutes or thereabouts. I sincerely wish you'd kept it to yourself. <laughs> 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 um, presiding officer, we're happy to support the Islands Bill. Uh, it has the potential to make a step change in the, into the way that islands are governed, empowering them to make decisions and that affect their own future. However, the bill as it stands is far too timid and could achieve absolutely nothing unless it's strengthened. As David Stewart said, the bill is a tribute to the work of the Three Islands Council with their vision for our islands, our future. And I hope we can strengthen this bill to realise their dream. We do need high level objectives in the bill and I was disappointed that the minister appears not to be keen on this. At the moment, the bill is just warm words, simply. It needs to be clear on why we are legislating on this subject. Colin Smith said the bill needs to have an ambition in order to meet it. High expectations about what the bill can and will do, and they are not there in its current form. So I really believe that we need to have those high-level expectations on the face of the bill. Things like, for example, depopulation, and David Cameron spoke about this as well. And last week, Community Land Scotland had put a submission in with regard to the planning bill to address repopulation. Lewis MacDonald, in his speech, illustrated this in much more detail than I can here, talking about Terence and Kilda and Scarp, really giving life to this policy of repopulation and filling places that were depopulated before. And I think also um, that um, Angus MacDonald illustrated this really well in a, from a personal point of view, talking about the Skinner factor, uh, when he illustrated why people leave. They've had enough, they fight against the elements for so long, and then eventually um, they can't fight anymore and they leave. And that was recognised in... And by the EU and I think that's why so many of us have concerns about Brexit because the EU recognised subsidiarity and David Stewart talked about this in some detail as well but recognised the need for local decision making and recognised that areas had permanent handicaps and that's true for our island communities. The bill looks at island impact assessments John Scott. Thank you for taking the intervention. Um, would the desertification which you describe as ha taking place in the islands, would you also acknowledge that it's a feature, regrettably, of our remote and rural communities as well, and that this is a much wider problem that needs to be addressed? Rhoda Grant. Indeed I do. I, um, I, I, I come from an area where um, that has happened, and I recognise that that is in remote rural areas, but, this, but, but it is worse in islands because you have sea to cross to, to get to services. 
but I think what we can do in this bill is find answers to some of those questions that then can be rolled out throughout rural areas and, and be used as, as good practice. And I think that will be to everyone's benefit. So this is not them against them. It is about trying to find better ways to support communities and repopulate areas, which I think is incredibly important. The island impact assessments or island proofing, I think, needs some, some, some uh, work done to it because, one, I don't think all the organisations that affect islands and their well-being are covered. So I think we need to look at that list of people that need to, to island proof their policies. I, th I believe the government must issue clear guidelines on how uh, authorities carry out those impact assessments and Mike Frumbles uh, made that point in his speech and there has to be a mechanism a right of appeal because otherwise it will just become a tick box, box exercise and that doesn't help anyone. We also need retrospective assessments and I think there has to be a mechanism within the bill for doing that. Um, John Finney said not for everything, of course not for everything, but we all know of pieces of legislation that are now having serious impacts on island communities and I think we need to go back and where there is a united um, expectation that those are going to be dealt with and enough people asking for it, there has to be a mechanism to allow that to happen. The islands plans as well, presiding officer, um, so much of the bill hangs on the national islands plan. Very little detail appears in the bill and we're promised that all this detail will be uh, contained in the islands plan. So the, the bill should uh, state the overarching principles, but the islands plan says how that is going to be carried out. And I think it's important that there is a, an islands plan, but we also recognise that all islands are different and that the plan must look at those differences as well as what binds them together. One example of um, how you island proof and indeed how uh, islands plans need to work is recognising how those islands differ. And Ross Finney talked about local contractors. When we were in Orkney, um, we noticed that the local hospital had to put into place a wood burning stove. They have no wood in Orkney, but they've got loads of cheap electricity and that seemed absolutely crazy and a really bad policy. In conclusion, presiding officer, um, John Mason talked about how the committee had gone out and about to a lot of the islands and my colleague here, Colin Smith, said to me that I had all the fun of the committee and now he's got the heavy lifting to take place. But I see those islands all the time. It's a real privilege to represent all but two of Scottish and Scotland's inhabited islands. And I, I do have um, a distinct um, knowledge of what they need to make a real difference. And it is ambition. They have the ambition, the three islands councils, to come forward w with um, the Our Islands, Our Future, which has taken the legislation to this stage. And we need to meet that ambition and that expectations and strengthen the bill in stage two. Thank you very much. I call on Jamie Green, who closed for the Conservatives. Eight minutes, please, Mr Green. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> uh, no man is an island entire of itself. Of course, the famous words, uh, not of John Mason, but of John Donne's in his famous 17th century poem. But the reality is that islands are entire of themselves in many ways. They face a unique set of challenges which mainlanders do not always face or even always understand. A weekend in Millport or a week in August on the Isle of Arran might give you a flavour of the beauty of or the warm reception that you receive on our islands, but it probably doesn't give you an insight, perspective of the difficulties that locals face. Now, our island constituents come to us as MSPs rightfully pointing out discrepancies in accessing public services, be it travelling to the mainland to see a hospital consultant and being given an appointment, which is before the arrival of the first ferry, or the cost of importing goods when trying to build a home of your own on an island. And they all share common difficulties, the cost of petrol on islands, the lack of mains gas, groceries at inflated prices, and often the poor state of many of their roads. Now, Scotland's 93 islands make up 2% of our population, but many will balloon in size during busy peak seasons. They are at the very heart of what makes Scotland unique on the international stage. Tourists flock to their distilleries, to climb their mountains and to sail their coasts. But they are also home to people with thriving communities which face harsh weather conditions, making connectivity tricky. 
There are economies which have changed and evolved, but many are still struggling. And they have public services which are struggling to retain and recruit doctors, teachers and carers. I think Kate Forbes eloquently outlined some very practical examples of the illogical provision of public services. And whilst many policies aim to improve Ireland life, such as RET, are very welcome, we also took evidence from Islanders as to some of the negative effects that these uh, inflated visitor numbers have had on the infrastructure of islands. And those islands which have not seen an exodus of their enthusiastic young generation are growing, but they are growing with an aging population, as many flock to retire on islands and enjoy the next chapter of their lives with the stunning views and friendly communities that islands offer. But all of this comes at a price, and we have a responsibility to address those challenges. My colleague John Scott reminds us that this bill was not born out of top-down government or out of party political motivations, but it has grown from a grassroots need to look at how public bodies address inequalities on islands. And for that reason, I too commend the work of Our Islands, Our Future. Now, being a member of the REC committee, I've been very privileged to get a glimpse into island life through our visits and evidence sessions. And whilst we sit in the wood-lined committee rooms here of Hollywood, it's very easy to, easy to forget the work that we do here affects those on the other side of a Logan Air flight. Ireland themselves are as diverse and different as is rural Scotland to urban Scotland. Indeed, island groups themselves often struggle with the remote, remoteness of some of their own island communities who feel like their island mainland is just as disconnected from them as the mainland mainland. Now, we took a trip to Mull and Orkney and we spoke to people with that very view. It is neither a criticism or a disappointment of the bill, but by its very nature, it is a one-size-fits-all fit, bill because it has to meet its objection as an enabling bill. But we should remember that a one-size-fits-all approach will not work for our communities when it comes to the National Islands Plan. Edward Mountain and Colin Smith also mentioned that each island has their own individual identity, and that must be taken into account in the production of the plan. I'd also like to touch briefly on some of the other issues raised today. Uh, in evidence sessions to the committee, the uh, Highland and Islands Enterprise uh, gave some important comments made by members in this debate as well, that the issues faced by islands are the same as those faced by other remote rural communities, and that the consequences of this bill, whilst it is focused on islands, should not negatively affect or impact other rural communities. If anything, it could be an opportunity to be a positive influence on them. Much has been said around the request from the committee in its report that the government considers a high-level objective or aim to this bill. And I should add that this did not come from MSPs. This came from members of the community themselves. Now, I recall sitting around the table uh, with a group on our visit to Mull, and there, there was unanimous agreement that what was lacking from the bill was a high-level objective. And it would be difficult to see what the overarching outcome of the bill was. And that rather than just have due regard to islands, there should be measurable objectives so that we can look back as a parliament and decide if the bill achieved what it was meant to. Now, notwithstanding the legal implications around the sort of language that might be used to achieve that, I would ask the minister not to rule this out, given the quite broad support for it. Uh, another important issue was raised around the retrospective scope of this bill. Um, I agree that it would be unreasonable to propose a blanket uh, retrospective assessment of all current policies or indeed any service changes made by every public body since devolution, but there may very well be existing policies that could and should be looked at if they are currently deemed to be negatively affecting islands and what is the mechanism to do that. On a similar, vein, a similar vein, the committee made a very clear recommendation that islanders should have a uh, clear mechanism which provides the ability to appeal or object to an island impact assessment decision. But perhaps the issue which bore the most contention around this bill was around that of expectations. The concept of so-called island proofing uh, has been discussed at great length, both in committee and in this chamber. The term has been interchangeably used with the island impact assessments. But the two are not the same. Now, much can be said over whether we really can properly island proof 
all decisions made by all public bodies and all government departments. If we were truly to island proof, the cost would be unparalleled and indeed probably unthinkable. The biggest risk facing us as we present this bill to Parliament and the communities it seeks to serve is that of raising false hope and false expectations. Uh, many members spoke with concern over the financing of this bill and the need for clarity over the effect it has on funding decisions. At present, the only costs in the financial memorandum relate to those around the delivery of the duties of the bill. But I want to put this into context. This is not about opposition parties asking for more money, but this is an honest realization amongst all of us here today that true island proofing undoubtedly comes at a cost. Presenting officer, I'm very pleased to support this bill as a welcome step forward in how government and its public agencies addresses our island communities. We need to ensure that the outcome of this bill is a robust national islands plan that reflects the priorities of islanders. It's a plan which has clear outcomes, targets, and measurable indicators, and that we see honesty and transparency from government so that when they make decisions which could negatively impact islanders, they're honest about those and accept that there may not be resource or funds available to mitigate the consequences of every action that government takes. The end product of this bill should be a tangible and a noticeable shift in the mindset of how decisions which are made in the lofty offices of government in Glasgow or Edinburgh affect people on islands. It cannot be warm words with no action or weight. I ask the Minister to consider the recommendations of the Stage 1 report in his response. We welcome this bill, but policy decisions today should already be mainstreamed and ingrained in their culture. We do not uh, need a bill to consider islands. That can be done already today. Expectations are high amongst islanders, so we cannot let them down. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Minister Hamza Yusuf to wind up the debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I say that this debate has been an excellent one? I thought the uh, contributions from across the chamber uh, have certainly given me a lot to reflect on, uh, and my officials, of course, to reflect on, and I'll try to address some of the key themes, uh, but it's been a largely consensual uh, debate, even getting praise from some members of the opposition. Can I say to David Stewart uh, that if there was one member of the opposition I'd want praise from, and I'm sure it won't be a kiss of death, it would be uh, David Stewart, because without him, I would not have known uh, about the Japanese Remote Islands Development Act, and uh, I have to say, after hearing about it at the committee, I did go to research it and look it up, most of the information was in Japanese, but nonetheless, I now know that there is 421 uh, inhabited islands in Japan out of 7,000. Every day is an education uh, with David Stewart uh, in uh, the committee. Um, I want to address some of the key themes that I thought were mentioned across the chamber. So I can get right into it, presiding officer. Uh, expectation management. It was one of the key themes uh, that have been raised, I think, almost by every single contribution. What I want to say about that is that whenever I've travelled to the islands, I've tried to uh, ensure that expectations, yes, uh, are absolutely there uh, for the islands bill, but to say that uh, we are doing more than just the islands bill. There's a whole suite of measures uh, for our islands that we're taking forward. For example, uh, Crown Estate Bill, of course, uh, community empowerment legislation, uh, indeed the National Islands Plan uh, itself uh, as well. So I do want to ensure that the bill is not seen in isolation, but rather, rather uh, as I say, is a suite uh, of, of, of measures. Uh, many members have mentioned uh, around the idea of putting in a high level objective in the bill. I am listening to, to what uh, the reasoning and the rationale behind that is. Uh, although I am not convinced, uh, clearly many, many members across this chamber are, and therefore I promise to give it uh, further uh, reflection. What I would say is for me, for legislation, the reason why a high level objective would not be in there is because it doesn't really give meaningful legal effect and legislation should be there for meaningful legal effect. What it could be in is, for example, a national islands plan and guidance uh, and so on and so forth. But I hear what the chamber uh, is saying. Uh, yes, of course I would. The Scotland Act, Donald Dewar, of course, famously said, there shall be a Scottish Parliament. That was the high level that we're sort of talking about. If it's good enough for the Scotland Act 98, it should be good enough for this bill too. Minister. Well, somebody else made that uh, point too uh, when it came to, to, to the Scotland Act. So, uh, as I said, I'm not closing off, uh, not being closed minded. Uh, I will listen. I suspect that members will probably at stage two bring in some uh, sort of amendment possibly uh, to that effect. So, let's not be close uh, minded uh, to it. Uh, in terms of uh, a few other really important issues that were raised, 
uh, key themes that were raised during the debate. Uh, I just want to make uh, the point when it comes to the suite of measures that we're taking forward. Uh, some people mentioned the, the financial memorandum uh, and the fact that perhaps uh, the National Islands Plan uh, is not accounted for in terms of finances. I just want to say, obviously, I don't have a crystal ball. The National Islands Plan is not just my plan, it's our plan. Every single one of us will be involved in the development of it. And therefore, when it comes to the financial uh, resource behind it, clearly that will be a discussion I'll be having with the Cabinet Secretary to my left uh, once that National Islands Plan uh, is very much uh, developed. In terms of the National Islands Plan, many members mentioned uh, around about statutory uh, local uh, island plans. Uh, really, uh, I will, as my response to the committee said, then I will uh, have that conversation with local authorities. I would want to have it with them uh, as opposed to imposing it upon them. Uh, but I am very aware of what members uh, have said on that. I suspect, actually, uh, it will come about organically uh, anyway. But uh, co continuing on with National Islands plans, the other key themes mentioned were around having national targets, um, having uh, measures in place that uh, could be monitored uh, and evaluated. So I would agree uh, with that. A National Islands plan has to be meaningful uh, and perhaps uh, measures, targets and so on and so forth will be part of that. So, uh, as I say, uh, the National Islands plan will be a consultative effort uh, and therefore, uh, I will not be close-minded to that. Uh, Gail Ross and Colin Smith both mentioned uh, national heritage and, and needing national, uh, think, uh, giving consideration to having national heritage in the bill. Um, again, that might be something that will be for the National Islands Plan uh, to look at and to consider. But once again, as continuing the theme that I have from the beginning uh, of this bill, I will not be uh, close-minded to that. Yes, of course. Gail Ross. Um, alongside the heritage, does the Minister agree that the massive renewable energy potential of the Scottish Islands still has to be realised as well? Minister. Uh, yes, uh, without uh, a doubt. And of course, uh, for many places that I've travelled, it's not just about the very real impact uh, and benefits that renewable energy can bring, but the fact that, for example, in Orkney uh, and other places, uh, t innovative technology has been tested. Uh, very much uh, on our uh, islands and uh, of course uh, we welcome the UK government's U-turn on some of this uh, through pressure from my colleagues Paul Wheelhouse, uh, Fergus Shewing and many many uh, others uh, as well. Uh, talking about island proofing uh, and of course related to that is impact assessments. Uh, the, the chamber has clearly said that uh, there needs to be some clarity in terms of the definitions and again uh, we will uh, absolutely reflect on that. I should say island proofing is a concept uh, impact assessments or island impact assessments are very much the process. Uh, similar to equality impact assessments, we have a, a very robust process from screening, evidence gathering, assessing, decision making and signing off uh, and publication. Uh, a very robust process there in place. Uh, but clearly all of us are in agreement that we just don't want to have a tick box exercise. So therefore, when the statutory guidance uh, comes forward, uh, we will make sure that we uh, reflect uh, on that. Uh, yes, of course. Jamie Green. I thank the Minister for taking the mention. On, on that very point, what does he think would happen in the event that an island impact assessment produces uh, an outcome that states that there will be a negative impact of a government policy decision on island communities? At that stage, is it likely that that decision would be reconsidered or additional funds may be put there to mitigate the consequences of that? In practical terms, that is real island proofing uh, in, in reality. Minister. I'm very conscious of time, so what I will do is send Jamie Green uh, the example that I've just given of the equality impact assessment. So uh, because of the five stages in the equality impact assessment, uh, that sort of uh, a scenario that he paints should be generally uh, avoided. So uh, that is one example, and I'll send him uh, that uh, example. I, I do want to try to make some progress because I'm very limited with time. When it comes to island proofing, I would refer back to the point I thought made very well by Kate Forbes around immigration. One of the biggest challenges our islands face undoubtedly uh, is that of depopulation. Uh, and it would be useful, I think, if the UK government could look at what we're going to do in island proofing uh, here, because while we have many of the levers, of course, in our hands, many other of the levers to help reverse the trajectory of depopulation uh, are in the hands of the UK government. I thought Gail Ross, I thought John Scott made good points and others around rural proofing, as well as island proofing. Uh, of course, uh, having travelled across much of Scotland, I know that the challenges faced by uh, rural communities uh, may well be just as, uh, just as challenging, just as difficult uh, as many of our island uh, communities. I, I have a minute, but of course, since it's my favourite member of the opposition. Uh, Davis Church. Uh, 
Thank, that has ruined my career. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, I'm very grateful for that intervention, uh, allowing the intervention. Could you make clarify a technical point? Will the Zetland and Orkney County Council Acts of 1974 be uh, repealed or replaced? Minister. Uh, no. <laughs> we have uh, no intention of, of leading uh, to do that. And I'll come to the points that were made by his colleague, uh, Lewis MacDonald, with the time that I, I have left. Um, they were largely the points that were raised in the Law of Society uh, submission, which I thought was uh, very helpful and very uh, useful. As defined in the bill, island communities uh, does go beyond just geography. Section 2B of the bill, uh, if the member has a chance to have a look, sets out that it is based on more than just geography. It is around common interest, identity or geography. Uh, the definitions in the bill uh, work for the purposes required. Uh, uninhabited islands can absolutely be covered by the National Islands Plan. We've said that uh, already. But having said that, he made some, you know, many, many points, which I can't go into in the last minute that I have uh, around the impacts, perhaps, of unintended consequences. So we will reflect on the Law Society submission, what Lewis MacDonald uh, has said. Uh, President Officer, I'm aware that I'm acutely uh, almost uh, out of time. Uh, what I would say is that this Islands Bill is absolutely historic. I'm pleased that across the chamber, members have recognised the historic nature of that. Although I am the Minister, very proud to introduce the bill, uh, thanks also must go to, of course, the local authorities. My predecessors, the first ever Minister uh, for Islands, uh, Derek, Derek Mackay, the local authorities, the Island Strategic Group, and the committee who gave really con uh, careful consideration to the bill, and I thank them very much for that. And I've got no doubt that if we get this right, and we, of course, very much uh, intend to do so, then we will reverse the depopulation, I hope, of our islands, along with the other uh, measures that we're taking. And uh, we know that, of course, our islands are 2% of the population of Scotland, but their value to Scotland uh, is absolutely uh, immeasurable. And uh, therefore, uh, as a boy who was born and bred and raised in Glasgow, uh, it has a gr been a great pleasure and a great honour of mine to have travelled to 30-plus islands uh, across Scotland. I intend to do this bill uh, justice and I thank members across this chamber for their careful consideration, for their suggestions, for their contributions and uh, really looking forward to pass this historic piece of legislation. Thank you very much and that concludes the stage one debate on the Islands Scotland Bill. The next item, point of order, Patrick Harvey. Uh, I'm, I'm Patrick, oh, yes. <laughs> Point of order, Patrick Harvey. Ten years without doing that and twice in one week, presiding officer. I'd like to raise a, a point of order uh, under Rule 3.1D of our standing orders, which states that your role as presiding officer includes the responsibility to represent the parliament in discussions and exchanges with any parliamentary, governmental, administrative or other body, whether within or out with the United Kingdom, and also in relation to the general principles of section 15 of our standing orders on openness and accessibility, the purpose of which is in to ensure that parliamentary scrutiny takes place in a spirit of openness and accessibility. Yesterday, the UK government wrote to you uh, regarding material they wish to make available on an extraordinarily limited basis to MSPs to look at in a condition of secrecy. Uh, that letter was sent to business managers and committee conveners at one o'clock, which was the end of the first session of this limited availability, the rest of which is either during times when Parliament itself is sitting in the chamber or at a time when MSPs are in their constituencies and regions. And I've since been told that of the small number of people who did manage to make it to this limited session this afternoon, many were only given the opportunity to look at even number, numbered pages, turning what is a, an insult into a farce. Presiding officer, can I ask what your response was uh, on our behalf, on behalf of Parliament, to the UK government for this absurd, limited amount of scrutiny that's been made available? Mr Walker, the, the UK minister, describes this as facilitating parliamentary scrutiny. Parliamentary scrutiny must be transparent and open under the, the spirit of section 15 of our standing orders. And I hope that you, on our behalf, will communicate to the UK government a rejection of this sign of complete contempt.
Uh, thank you. Can I thank Mr Harvey for the advance notice of his point of order? And I would also add that uh, I'm not surprised uh, to hear you express your dismay in such a manner. Uh, for your information and that of other members, uh, I should first of all note that uh, my office circulated this letter to business managers and conveners of the relevant committees as soon as I was aware of it, which was this afternoon at lunchtime following First Minister's questions. I understand, fully understand the concerns that you raise and I agree that the arrangements put in place for MSPs to view the documents offer limited opportunity for scrutiny and further that it is unhelpful to receive such late notice of those proposals. I trust that the UK Government will reflect on the arrangements that they have put in place and if the, if the member wishes to raise these objections further, I would advise him to do so directly with the UK Government. Now the next item of business the next item of business is consideration of motion 9803 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the Islands Scotland Bill. Can I call on Derek Mackay to move the motion, to speak to or just move the motion? Formally moved, moved. Presiding officer. And we come now to decision time and there are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 10358 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the Islands Scotland Bill at stage one be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the second question and final question is that motion 9803 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the Island Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.